بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد نبي كريم صلى الله عليه وسلم he mentions in a hadith that whenever a haji he says لبيك then each and everything from the stones from the trees each and everything on the ground towards his left and his right each and everything cries out لبيك so when one haji he says labbaik each and everything upon the face of this earth cries out labbaik until the end of the earth imagine your status is look at who you are you have been accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regardless of the fact that because of this uncertainty you are accepted to go for hajj or not this intention that you have made to go for hajj this is from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if not this year then inshallah next year but this is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those people who are going for hajj you have a great status and a great level in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he mentioned that that haji who goes to for hajj he stays away from obscenity he stays away from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he will return back to his hometown like a newborn baby just as a newborn baby it comes to the face of this earth completely sinless Likewise, if you stay away from the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will return back to your hometown, your vicinities, your cities, your towns, just as the same way, completely sinless, washed away from your sins. So firstly, I would like to congratulate each and every person who keeps this intention of going for hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you, grant you khair, grant you um, grant you afiat and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for you throughout the way inshallah just a few announcements before the program actually starts number one that inshallah after the actual program we will have some literature that we will be distributing now the packs that we have there is a contribution towards these packs it's about two pound fifty so each and every person is requested to contribute at least two pound fifty for this literature it has a packet or it has a book for how to perform Umrah, how to do Ziyarah, how to perform Hajj, there is also Dua Kitabs. It is very, very useful information. Like if you are traveling on the plane whilst going to Mecca, whilst going to Medina, wherever you may be, there is complete information, very, very useful information that you can read and you will make a complete image in your mind with regards to what you need to do when you come to Mecca, when you come to Medina and whilst you are carrying out your Hajj. Also, there are going to be handouts after the program in sh um, for those brothers who do not have sisters in the Kuwaitul Islam Education Center. So if you have the women folk, i.e. spouses or daughters, sisters, whoever in the Kuwaitul Islam Education Center, then the men are requested that do not take these handouts. Inshallah, they will be distributed down there. So for those men who have women folk in the Kuwaitul Islam Education Center, please do not take these handouts. And also one other announcement is that there will also be a Kuwaitul Islam broadcast link that will be sent out for those people who have any sort of queries who have any sort of questions if you do have questions whilst after the program whenever it is then inshallah there will be a link provided where you can actually put in your questions and inshallah we will be we'll try our best to facilitate and answer your questions without taking much of your time i will call mala nasab to come and deliver the hajj program uh, brothers if i can just ask you all to come a bit closer please so it feels like we're all together at least, um, if not in the aeroplane, at least here today, inshallah. Bismillahir <coughs> Rahmanir Rahim. نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد 
كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد ولله على الناس حج البيت من استطاع إليه سبيلا صدق الله العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to part two of our Hajj program, inshallah, which will kick off today. Um, and the intention for this session will be uh, quite, quite detailed, but inshallah, we'll try to keep it as similar to yesterday, um, around half four finish. So do get yourselves as comfortable as possible. Um, and hopefully, inshallah, if there are any questions and queries, we'll answer them along the way. Um, and if there is anything that we've missed out or you feel that we've not covered, then uh, we'll, we'll take at the end. We'll start off very quickly, just as a, if anybody wants to call out um, any key takeaways from yesterday, anything that stuck with you, that you felt that that was something that's beneficial, um, and we can just reiterate that. Anybody want to share anything? Should we just pick on somebody? Jazakallah. So the ruling of the mask, obviously we said that if the mask is on for 12 hours continuously, then that is when you have to give a dumb penalty. But obviously we know that the, the work around that is, we won't wear it for a full continuous 12 hours. Jazakallah for sharing that. Jibai. No, no, it's good. It's just a, a, a means of, mashallah, stamping in knowledge. The first thing that you said about packing 30 kilograms of sorrow. Okay. Mashallah, Jazakallah again for sharing that. So making sure that we pack as much sabr as we can, 30 kg is a very specific amount, Mashallah. Um, anything over that would be overload, right? Um, so, so Jazakallah for, for sharing. Um, so making sure that we, we pack as much sabr and like we shared yesterday, that it's fine. You know, this, this roller coaster of a journey, um, every step along the way, whether that be the highs and the lows, if we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, each step of the way we make that a point of dua, that will be a means of khair for all of us. Jazakallah. And if you just have one more, please, brother. Um, just the three minutes, seven kilometers, whatever you do, yeah. Yep. So just have the amount of Excellent. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Jazakallah, Mufti Hanif Sab, for, for sharing that as well. So one way and one tip of knowing uh, which round you're on, um, and obviously keeping your focus, is to play the seven kalimas throughout um, the seven rounds of the tawaf as well. Jazakallah. Anybody else want to share anything? I don't want anybody to feel like I'm not... Brother, do you want to share anything? Okay, Jazakallah. So we'll make a, we'll make a start um, on, on, on the Hajj guide. Um, and just to, to start off with, as we reiterated yesterday, Alhamdulillah, this is a, a journey of love. This is a journey of, of total devotion and sacrifice to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, when a person is going, as we, as we hear time and time again, the Layla when, when, or the, uh, mashallah, you know, we, we have the, the love stories as such. That when a person goes to the house of his beloved, doesn't matter how many blockades are in the way, doesn't matter how many barriers or road bumps are, are there, kante bhi bichha diye, tab bhi koi baat nahi. why? Because the end goal is the maqsad. The, 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 the end which we'll see inshallah, which will be the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything along the way we will withhold and we will withstand and we will inshallah bear patience. Why? Because the happiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and getting the forgiveness of Allah supersedes everything else. So this is a journey of love. This is a jihad for the people who are weak. This is a means of our rizq and our sustenance inshallah increasing. And obviously if we start off with that, that one of the rewards you can see there, um, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a very beautiful hadith mentions that al umrah to ila al umrah kafara to lima bayna huma. And not only that, wal hajjul maburur laysa lahu jazaun illa al jannah. That be performing one umrah and then the next umrah, the subsequent umrah, the umrah after that becomes a means of all the sins that have happened between them being wiped off. And inshallah, the reward of a hajj maburur, an accepted hajj, is nothing besides jannah. And that is our goal. That when we return, like our Imam Sab just shared the hadith earlier. مَنْ حَجَّ لِلَّهِ فَلَمْ يَرْفُثْ وَلَمْ يَفْسُقْ رَجَعَكَ يَوْمٍ وَلَدَتْهُ أُمَّهِ A person who takes and undertakes this journey of Hajj, there's no ill, there's no sin, there's no obscenities, there's nothing that he does against the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
he will return back home the day I would like the day his mother gave birth to him meaning he will be free from all sins the second hadith that is there is Tabi'u al Hajj wal Umrah continue to have this uh, intention in your head that I will I will be consecutive between my Hajj and my Umrah if I've gone for Hajj this year inshallah I'll follow up with a Umrah next and then I'll follow up with a Hajj thereafter in the future or inshallah I'll do another Umrah why because فَإِنَّهُمَا يَنْفِيَانِ الْفَقْرَ وَالذُّنُوبِ Because what does Umrah and Hajj do? They remove and they get rid of, number one, Al-Faqr, poverty. Something that all, you know, unfortunately, uh, because of the current climate, it's always in front of our eyes. This, uh, this notion of uh, the, the living costs and how are we going to make ends meet. But the beauty of performing Hajj and Umrah, one after the other, as often as possible, is that they will remove Faqr, poverty, and Dhunub, sins, the same way fire removes the impurities that are on iron. So the same way a furnace gets rid of all the ill and all the impurities that are on metal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will rid us of all sins as well. And finally, you can see the final hadith there, Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates, that al-hujjaj wal-ummar wafdullah. You people who are intending to go for hajj, you are the delegation that has been selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is your speciality? If you call on to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your dua. If you seek forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept the forgiveness that you make or the forgiveness that you seek. And for all those people that you seek forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also do that as well. So before we go, yesterday we touched upon the fada'il of Umrah. Today, before we introduce the Hajj, it's really important that we keep these in mind. Why? Because it makes that journey even more special. I know that inshallah when I return, if I continue with this focus, with this patience, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant me so much more. So as a quick overview, you have on screen a, uh, a synopsis and a whole overview of what the Hajj looks like. On the left hand side, you can see the Faruz, which are the compulsory acts. We talked about ihram and how do you come into the state of ihram with making the intention and then reciting the talbiyah thereafter. The wuquf and the stay of Arafah is also farz. And finally, the tawaf is ziyara, which will be happening uh, from the 10th onwards, is also farz. So these are the three main farz acts uh, that are compulsory in, uh, in the hajj. And on the right, uh, right hand side, you can see what the wujub and the wajibats are. So to make sure that we stay in Arafat all the way until sunset, that we don't leave there, inshallah, when you'll go, you'll see, and we'll show you pictures throughout the session today, that uh, there'll, be, there'll be large boards that will say Arafat starts here, Arafat ends here, so you'll be required to stay within that vicinity. Uh, the pelting of the Jamarat, which you can see uh, on, my, on my right here, so again, that is wajib. The sacrifice, so this is not the normal sacrifice that we do at Bakr Eid time, um, and we'll talk about the differences between the two. The cutting of the hair, so the same way when we completed our Umrah, we made sure that we did Halaq uh, or Qasr and likewise we will be doing the same thing at the completion of, uh, of our Hajj. And then the fifth point is also important to note, that to make sure that there is an order between number 2, 3 and 4. So the pelting comes first, thereafter you make the sacrifice and thereafter you do Halaq. And to keep that order the, between number 2, 3 and 4 is also wajib. To complete the sa'i after the tawaf is ziyara, um, there's a stay in Muzdalifa. So there's the stay overnight, which is sunnah. But then there is a time about 2-3 hours, which is actually the wajib stay. And then right at the end, you've got tawaf e wada, which is the farewell tawaf as well. And obviously we'll mention it here and we'll mention it later on as well. That the farewell does not mean that you know, you're not allowed to enter the haram once again. If you've done your farewell tawaf, your tawaf e wada, you can still continue to come back into the haram and perform uh, your other uh, your other tawafs if you wish, your other ibadat as well. So this is just an overview um, and, the, and the slides that will be shared, the, the handout that you'll have, will have all of this information on there. So as soon as it's the seventh stroke, the eighth of Dhul Hijjah, we've alhamdulillah been in Makkah for a really long time, or what will probably feel very short. Um, and we've prayed all our namaz, mashallah, with Jamaat. We've had this intention of praying uh, an entire Quran throughout the whole, uh, throughout our stay in Makkah, throughout our stay in Medina, and we've tried to maximize all of our efforts. Why? Because who knows when we'll return again? And just before then, we are now getting prep. We are now getting prepped mentally for what is going to be a very, very important five days ahead. So, 
On the seventh, which majority of the groups or the, the, the coaches, etc., take you on the seventh, but the preferred method is to leave on the eighth. So again, I make the, you know everything that we say today, especially during the five days of Hajj, we're going to share with an asterisk to say, you know, you know, before we had COVID edit, right? You know, things were COVID edits. Now we'll have Hajj 22 edit, 1443, inshallah. So what we'll share with you today will be uh, according to the previous years. But do bear in mind that some of these things uh, can change. And obviously, we'll find out more information over the next few days. So we start off by coming into the state of ihram. Like we touched yesterday, the two pieces of clothing are not the ihram themselves. You call it the ihram. But we come into the state of ihram by the 8th of the hijjah Ideally from masjid al haram So we've prayed uh, the fajr of, of the 8th of the hijjah in, in the masjid. And thereafter, after sunrise, we then uh, pray the two rakats of ihram And you can see there that we have the same procedure in terms of preparation. And what was that? That we did ghusl beforehand. If there's any unwanted hair, we've removed all of that. And now we're getting ready to put on these two pieces of cloth. And then once we've put them on, uh, you, you do the same two procedures. And what is that? That you pray the two rakats, Surah Kafirun and Surah Ikhlas. I think somebody asked earlier that what's the purpose of praying these two surahs, Surah Kafirun and Surah Ikhlas. So in Surah Kafirun, what are we doing? Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun, la a'budu ma ta'budun. There is nafi of everything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in one, in one rakat, what are we praying? We're praying, Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun, Surah Kafirun. Why? Because we're negating everything besides the existence of Allah. And in the second rakat, we pray Surah Ikhlas because that is the Tawheed that is mentioned in that Surah. And therefore, we really, really continue to remind ourselves of number one, La ilaha illallah. There's nothing besides Allah. And then this Ikhlas of illallah, Allah is alone. So it's important that when you're praying these uh, rakats and you're praying these, uh, th these two units of prayer, that you keep that in mind. Why do we pray Kafirun and Ikhlas? That doesn't mean we pray that in every namaz, by the way. Uh, Alhamdulillah, which is probably our, our state. Um, so same, uh, same procedure as before in terms of preparation. And then after the two rakats are finished, we make the intention of coming into the ihram for hajj. What is the ihram for hajj? Um, I, and what is the need for hajj? Exactly the same as we did for umrah. So in umrah, we said, oh Allah, I intend to perform umrah. Make it easy for me. Accept it for me. When it comes to hajj, exactly the same thing. Oh Allah, I intend to perform hajj now. Make it easy for me. Accept it from me. And then we make dua and we recite the talbiyah. And as you've heard the virtue already by our Imam Sab who shared that there is no person who recite, this is one of the shi'ars of Hajj, one of the symbols of Hajj, that you recite the talbiyah aloud, not in chorus of groups and groups of people, but you recite it aloud. Why? Because this is your expression of love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is you saying to Allah, I am here. And the louder that we recite it, it'll keep our focus. And obviously you have the virtue of everything on your right and left hand side. Every living, non-living thing will also be reciting the talbiyah with us. Allahu Akbar. So it's really important that we keep this in mind and it'll keep our focus and our zone towards what we're about to do. So we come in by reciting the talbiyah and now all the rules of ihram will now apply. Uh, just very quickly, um, I won't take too long on this. But how do we wear the ihram once again? Two pieces of clothing, um, again, ideally white. Why? Because uh, th this is the Sunnah method, number one. But it also reminds us of the of, of the coffin, of the grave, that when we're going to be buried into the grave, this is exactly what we will have. All materialistic things, we're saying from now on, we're shunning to the side. Not only that, this ihram it, it is also a, a semblance, is also a reminder of there's no cultural, social, political differences within the people. Doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, Everybody in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the same. So, we shared this method yesterday. Either you can take this side up, around, and then simply fold. Um, or the, the methodology or second way I can show you, which I personally prefer, is you take the two edges, you push them to one side. Why? Because it just gives you a bit of extra protection down the center. There, a bit legs wide apart. And then you simply turn and fold all the way down to the bottom. Easy. And you know, even if somebody pulls it off, inshallah, it won't, uh, it, it won't come off. So, we'll, so that's the bottom part. And then the top part, exactly the same. Uh, making sure that our navel until our below the knees are covered over the shoulder, right hand side, simply over the top. And there you go. Easy as that. Um, and again, like we shared yesterday, 
continue to practice this uh, in the confines of your own bedroom. Uh, you know, make sure that you try it once, two, three, four, five times. You can secure it with a belt if you wish. Um, and obviously the clothing, the cloth that you choose is also important. Why do we say that? Because sometimes you might see people there wearing very thin cotton ones. And you know, if somebody spills water or, or you sit on something, then at times it can actually become a bit see-through as well. So it's important that you choose the correct, uh, the, the, the correct piece of cloth. And not only that, uh, it, it, something that's a bit more comfortable, you know, if you're doing, you're doing wudu, then simply by putting the towel on top, it'll become a means of drying as well for you. So that's just a, a quick tip there. As we move on, so we've now come into uh, the state of Ihram, um, and we're now going to be carrying out the five days of Hajj. Uh, again, this is a good tip uh, for, for, all, for us all to note, that as we're setting off, ideally you don't want to take your suitcase with you for the next five days, because I'm sure the wheels will be damaged and everything else will be broken by the time you finish. You only take what's necessary. Why? Because you can always go back to your suitcases and everything else, wherever you're keeping it. Um, whether that, obviously now we're not entirely convinced or entirely sure whether it's going to be the shifting stroke, non-shifting package uh, or what does that look like. There's still some uncertainty around that. Um, so your normal suitcases, everything you can leave uh, at your hotel or wherever else the mutawif uh, leads instruct you to do so. Uh, but what you can do is take a rucksack with you over the course of the five days. And in there, uh, you know, yourselves, your wives, anybody else who, who's traveling with you, in that rucksack, which is really handy to carry, really, uh, really light, it's spread, you know, the distribution of the weight is across the body. So therefore, it doesn't feel like you're lugging something along. Uh, so, so take a rucksack with you um, and pack some of these items in there. So we talked about snacks, uh, light snacks. Again, uh, when it comes to food, it's really important that you know, you, you're, you're aware of your own self. Sometimes when, you know, when you've eaten too much, you feel lethargic. What we don't want to do is just pile on. Why uh, You know, I need to spend five days, so I need to uh, tank myself up and fill in as much as possible. Uh, but if you know that actually you struggle and you're going to struggle with uh, using the bathroom, etc., then, um, then, then, then do keep it light. Or if you feel like actually I need the energy and I need to fuel up, then whatever works for you and know yourself. So pack snacks. And the other intention that you also pack food for is Hajj is also a name of feeding other people. You know, um, we mentioned during the Fadail, but one of the PDFs we'll share with you is Fadail al-Hajj by Sheikh Zakriya rahmatullahi alayhi. Um, and it's really important that from now, when you're in the aeroplane, that you read one, two, three ahadith every single day. So then you become zoned about what we're about to do. So um, one of them, there's an entire chapter that Hajj is the name of feeding people. So we go with extras that anybody that we see en route, any of our colleagues that are with us, uh, people who are traveling with us, we share with them and inshallah it'll become a means of, uh, of, of reward for us, but also a means of acting upon the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam as well. So pack snacks, medication, clothing, spare ihram, uh, take some reading material with you, pack whatever toiletries you need, uh, a small pebble bag, bottle, sleeping arrangements that you might need. So you might have a, a, a really light uh, mattress with you. Not these mashallah nowadays when you go jamaat, we travel with the works as well, don't we? 10 centimeter mattress, self-inflatable and three pillows. Um, so, so do travel light because then inshallah it will become a bit more easier for you uh, to, to take from one place to the other. And then right at the end, we shared this yesterday as well, uh, keep your power bank with you because you might not find uh, facilities to charge your phone every which way. I just want to share a, a good question somebody asked about toiletries. Um, you know, obviously we're not allowed to use scented soap. So what about if somebody needs to relieve themselves, how do they then wash themselves? So the advice that we normally give is uh, disposable gloves. Um, so you can quickly, um, you know, you can clean yourself and then get rid. Or obviously you can have unscented soap that you can also use as well. So before we dive into the first, second, third, fourth day um, and fifth day of Hajj, this is just a, a brief overview that we'll keep coming back to. So we've started off by coming on number one. We've entered the Mikat. We've, uh, we've made sure that we have our Ihram uh, because all, at this moment in time, we're already in Makkah. So we'll just wear our Ihram from Makkah, from Masjid Haram. Um, and we've done our circling of the Kaaba. We've done all our Umrah, etc. So we're now going to stop from point number three. So the first day of Hajj starts on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, which is in Mina. From Mina, we'll go to Arafat on the 9th. From the 9th, we'll then go to Muzdalifah, which is number five there, which is the ninth night. And then from Muzdalifah, we'll go to number six, which is the 10th. And then we will stay, that sixth, basically, Mina is our base camp. 
and I'll show you pictures of that. Meaning, that will be your central point. Everything that you do over the five days of Hajj, you'll travel from there. So, Mina is your base camp. Whether you need to go to Arafat, you'll go from Mina. Then from Arafat, you'll travel to Muzdalifah, you'll come back to Mina. Once you perform Tawaf i Ziyara, you'll come back to Mina. So, this will become your home for the next five days. And I promise you, you'll see the picture and you think, what is that? But then over the next five days, like I said, it'll become more comfortable to you and it'll become a source of so much, inshallah, satisfaction and comfort for you that you'll feel like I want to stay here now, forget my, uh, forget my hotels. So uh, keep this picture in your, in your mind. So we started off in Makkah. We'll go to Mina, Mina to Arafat, Arafat to Muzdalifah, Muzdalifah to Mina. And you can see um, the three pillars there because that is where we're going to be doing the, the stoning of the Jamarat. And then from there, we'll go back to Makkah. Yep. Do we need to go back to Mita No, why? Because you're already in the Haram area. So now that we're doing Hajj, you can do you can put your ihram on from your hotel. It's absolutely fine. Um, and I'll go through that in the slides. So um, if we're walking, uh, again, um, Hajj 22 asterisk, uh, what does that look like? If we're walking as a group, and if your group allows you to walk, or the, the mutawif uh, groups that they've made, if they allow you to walk, then you will have something like this which is called Tariqul Mushat, the, 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 the pathway for all the people who are walking. Um, so this is on the eighth morning. This picture, um, it kind of uh, symbolizes what the, the Mina tents will look like. So this is a really nice picture. You know, savor it, take it in. Uh, because you can see the gadlas, the kind of small mattresses, uh, the, the lack of space between your right and left hand side is, is what you will have, inshallah. Uh, and like I said, it's a very, very nice place to be. No, no. If, they, if you have one, you'll be lucky. If you don't have one, then Alhamdulillah, whatever we have. Um, that's a really nice aerial view of the tent city known as Mina. Um, and Alhamdulillah, you know, you, you might think to yourself that I'll get a bit lost. But nowadays with the, uh, the, the, the advancement of our phones, you can drop your GPS location. Um, and I promise you, inshallah, you won't get lost. So, so all these little, little uh, nuggets, please do, to, do make note of them. So that's what Mina looks like from, a, from an aerial point of view. Everything's the same. Um, and the Europa camps, if, if they do put you there, uh, like previous years, are towards the back end of, uh, of the whole Mina complex. So there's a lot more walking um, for, for the people that are from Europe, meaning from, for us people, uh, because we're right towards the, towards the end. So this day, the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, is called Yawm al -Tarwiyah. Yawm al is an Arabic word. Again, you don't need to know the, uh, the intricacies of these words, but I'll share some of these with you. Uh, perhaps you remember them on the day, uh, or if you don't remember them, that's absolutely fine as well. So Yawm al the word al means to quench one's thirst. So on this day, on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, uh, what are we doing? The intention is that we're going to be quenching the thirst. Why? Bec the thirst of what? So first of all, the, the, the day of Tarwiyah, especially in the, in the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala Alimajmain, what would they do? They would take their animals with them. Why? Because on the tenth of Dhul Hijjah, we're going to be sacrificing these animals. So as they're taking their janwar and their animal, they would make sure on the eighth of Dhul Hijjah, because there's a lot of walking involved, we're going to feed our animals. Unko khub pani pilao. Yeah? Ourselves as well. We've got to we've got to prep for this, isn't it? So this preparation, this day is called Yawmut Tarwiya. Why? So that we fill ourselves and quench our thirst with water. On a spiritual level, this also means we start to pour water into ourselves, yes, but we start to pour spirituality within ourselves. The same way a land and water, uh, uh, a piece of soil becomes irrigated by the water that we pour on it, we've also got to do that to our souls and our hearts as well. So from now, we increase ourselves in spirituality. And you see that the 8th of Dhul Hijjah is a day simply of worship. There's nothing else involved besides doing ibadat. Why? Because we are prepping ourselves for what's to come thereafter. So on the 8th of Dhul Hijjah, like we said, Yawmut Tarwiyah, Tarwiyah is known, uh, the, the translation of Tarwiyah is to quench one's thirst. We will perform Fajr in Makkah or the Masjid wherever you're residing or closest to where you're residing. Uh, it's sunnah to leave Mina after sunrise. Uh, Mina also comes from the Arabic word Amna, which means to flow because this is where the blood of the animals that we will sacrifice will also be flowing. Uh, so it's permissible to leave on the, ninth, uh, on, the, on the night of the 7th if the coaches or the group is leaving. 
uh, obviously going alone and walking is not advised again so whatever the group um, in, indicates to you then do that if they allow you to to go on the eighth then that is sunnah and that is preferred to do obviously because of the arrangements for this year they might say to you we're going to take and we're going to start taking hujjaj from the seventh so what will you do everything that we did on the eighth you just do it the night before because of the arrangements and look if you have this intention okay, oh Allah, i want to act upon every single sunnah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you accordingly yeah you know the, the 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 state and the current climate does not perhaps allow us to do all of this but in our heart we have these intentions that i want to make my my hajj as close to the sunnah as possible so it's permissible to leave on the on the night of the seventh if the group or the the coaches indicate that you must do so otherwise it's better to leave on the eighth morning after fajr after sunrise what are we then going to do so we have now reached mina in mina we are going to pray our dhuhr asr our maghrib isha and the fajr of the ninth of dhul hijjah all of these five salat in mina so one more time let me just stamp that in we've got there and thereafter the first salah that we will pray in mina will be uh, will be zuhr asr maghrib isha and fajr of the next day like i said if the coaches take you earlier then that's fine you can pray the fajr morning there as well and we're going to engage in worship all throughout the day it's really important that we don't make this a time of catching up with people yeah where are you i'll come and catch up with you you know phone me whatsapp me we'll meet up none of this kind of stuff this is a day like i mentioned that the day itself is called yawm at why because we're, we're 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 putting spiritual water within ourselves we're irrigating the hard heart that we have so that over the next few days our hearts our hearts become softened and then inshallah everything that we do everything that we pray will start to get into the habit of increasing our spirituality and like mufti hanif sahib shared yesterday whatever makes you tick whatever makes you search that you're going to be focused is going to increase your spirituality that is what you do if you feel by praying quran for half an hour that's something i can do bismillah go ahead pray quran for half an hour if you then get a bit tired then do what then do dhikr for the next 15 20 minutes then uh, make dua for the next 15 20 minutes read fadail hajj for the next 15 20 minutes go for a short walk and then take your tasbih with you and make sure that you then do the the dhikr but our focus should be as we've put in bold intentionally engage in worship throughout the day this was the same time when nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam went from camp to camp from one khema to the next khema and he would invite people and give them the da'wah of deen so again if that is something that we can do we should also try to engage in that as well and it's sunnah to spend the night in mina that is what the camps look like again hajj of 2022 we're not entirely convinced to show uh, but but that's a nice picture to show you what the base camp will look like and what everybody uh, w w where how mashallah enclosed it is and you can see the love uh, already there between the people so what have we done on the 8th of dhul hijjah we reached in mina from mina we prayed the five salat and all we did was engage in engage in worship is there any other action to do on the 8th any other action by nothing else we just increase our spirituality why in preparation for the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, which is Yawmul Arafah. So the day itself is called Yawmul Arafah. The land and the place that we will go to is known as Arafat. So that is the place of land, uh, the, 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 the land itself. That is the name of the place. Those performing Hajj will not fast on the day of Arafah. That's one point to note. Remember, if we're here, we're fasting on the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. Why? Because we want the reward that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has mentioned in the hadith that those people who fast on the day of Arafah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive their sins past year, the year to come, previous year, etc. But those people who are performing Hajj, which inshallah will be you people, you will not fast on the day of Arafah. Why? Because you have so much to do on this day. So after sunrise, you will set off from Mina. Remember, we prayed five Salat. Zuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, Fajr. Once the sun has come up, we will then set off to go to Arafat. I'll take these uh, one at a time. So after sunrise, set off from Mina. It's, sun, it's sunnah to take a bath before the wukuf. So this is something again that, remember, like we said, all those things that are sunnah to do, we try to make sure that we do them. In Arafat, you will see that there's hundreds and thousands of uh, toilets all around, scattered and dotted around. So you go there, it has those overhead showers. 
and with the intention of sunnah before the wukuf. So if the wukuf starts from, as you can see there, uh, from midday to sunset, so let's take, let's take an example of uh, 12.30, you reach there at 9 a.m. Yeah, because you set off after sunrise, let's say that's about 7.30 a.m. And then you got there for 9 a.m. So you have now three hours, three, three and a half hours, nine o'clock till 12, half 12. What do you do? You can either rest, why? Because you've got a whole busy day ahead, or you can have your sunnah ghusl before that time. And obviously you can see there it's sunnah to take a bath before the wukuf. Arafat is more than six miles away uh, from Mina. It's actually, you know, technically eight miles away. And it's not advised to walk. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa himself, when he went from Mina to Arafat, he traveled on camelback. So it's also important, obviously we can't do that, but we also go with the intention of traveling on a conveyance and inshallah we will also get the reward of sunnah. Eat and rest before, before midday. Why? So do all of the stuff that you need to do. If you need to sleep, what you don't want to do is get there at 9 o'clock and then, boy, I'm ready for this. Eh? And what happens? You go all out ibadat and then by 12 o'clock, battery is flat. So when the time of worship is there, you do the right thing. So please make sure that if you need to rest, you do that. If you need to eat beforehand, uh, you, you do that as well. And again, be confident with what your body is like. If you know that actually by eating too much, I'll feel lethargic. And then after Zohar, I'm going to have to sleep till Asr. Then we're going to be wasting one of the most important days of, of, of the whole five days of Hajj. So know what works for you um, and then eat and rest before midday. And it's also, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this point here, that look, the intention is not to be awake for 24 hours. Sometimes what happens is when you're tired, then the buzz and the spiritual ecstasy that we're meant to be feeling gets lost. So rest at the right time and then make sure that when you're ready, you're fully zoned in and, and you're ready. So eat and rest before midday and then you're going to be engaging in worship. Uh, and we've, we've put an option which again personally works for myself and so many of our ulama also share this, that work on a carousel of 15 minutes. What is that? That pray 15 minutes, qaza salah, nafil salah, salatul hajjah, then stop. Then for the next 15 minutes, so from o'clock till quarter past, you're praying your nawafil and your qadha salah. Then from quarter past till half past, you're reciting some Quran. From half past till quarter to, you're doing some dhikr. And then from quarter to till o'clock again, you make some dua. And in this way, you'll inshallah spend a lot of your time in the right, in, in the right manner. But also you won't get bored, you won't, feel, uh, you won't feel tired as such. So, the day of Arafah, Yawmul Arafah, and just on the word Arafat itself, again, uh, the, these are nuggets to note, inshallah, to remember on the day. Arafat comes from the word Arafah, which means to know. Hazrat Jibreel, alayhi salatu was salam, when he was showing Hazrat Ibrahim, alayhi salatu was salam, that these are all the places that you will visit. This is something to note. This is something to note. This is the plain of Arafah. And then he turned to Hazrat Ibrahim, alayhi salatu was salam, and he said, Arafta, have you understood? Do you understand? So one of the reasons that this place is called Arafat is because of this reason. Likewise, the famous one that I'm sure we all know, Hazrat uh, Adam alayhi salatu was salam and Hazrat Hawa radiallahu anha alayhi salatu was salam, when they were sent down from Jannat, Arafat was the place where they then became acquainted with one another. They, they met once again at this place. And another reason that some scholars give is the word Arafah means to know, to recognize something. So this is the place where we have to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the place to be acquainted with Allah. And therefore, we make this day a really, really special day. According to the hadith of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Al-Hajj al-Arafah. What is Hajj? Hajj is the day of Arafat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives more people on this day than any other day of the calendar year. Allahu Akbar. So it's really important that we fully focus in our du'as, in our ibadat, in our worship, and ask and seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on, on this day. So Arafat is a really, really special day. It's preferable to make dua standing whilst facing the Qibla. Why? Because this is what Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa did. You'll have one big open camp where everybody will be in. So if your, your, your nature, your personality is such where you, you, know, you suffer from sunstroke, etc., you can stay indoors. Otherwise, you can actually go outdoors, which is preferred to do with Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa also did, and make dua out in the open. Um, and just a point of note there as well, uh, when you're wearing your ihram, is, um, especially if you're going to be out in the open sun, you know, mashallah, we've got 20 odd degrees right now, uh, and, and you know, we feel like we're struggling. So if you have an ihram like this, please do cover your neck this bit. Why? Uh, because a lot, of, a lot of people suffer from sunstroke 
uh, and, and that's a really good tip to stay away so keep your neck covered uh, the other thing that you can do is totally wet your ihram um, and, and keep that on you so then you feel cool at all times as well so it's preferable to make dua while standing uh, and facing the qibla and stay within the boundaries of arafat during this period so like we said the stay in arafat is farz that's why throughout the day you'll hear hundreds of helicopters people will uh, people who are unfortunately not so well just so that this farz is done the government arrange for people to be passed over the plains of arafat why so that even if they stay for a few seconds their farz is done um, but we're going to stay there even though we might reach before before noon time from midday all the way until sunset just a few points to note here so where are we we were on mina from mina we've now come to arafat the day of arafat is also the day when the takbir of tashriq will also start so it's wajib to recite tashriq uh, takbir of tashriq after the farz uh, you can see there allahu akbar allahu akbar la ilaha illallah wallahu akbar allahu akbar walillahi alhamd men will recite it audibly out loud and women will recite the takbir softly when does it begin it begins on the fajr of the day of arafat 9 10 11 12 so five times four 20 and on the 13th it's until after asr so the fajr zuhr and asr of the 13th as well so that's just a, a point to note on the side You'll see massive boards like this, Bidaya to Arafat, that this is where Arafat starts and you've got to keep yourself within that plane from midday all the way until sunset. So that's one image. That's what it looks like inside the camp of Arafat. And that is a nice aerial screenshot there as well to show you uh, what, what does Arafat look like for the people that are around. So this is an important slide to note. When it comes to the day of Arafat, the first thing I'll mention here is, look, we're not traveling with people that we used to travel with. Why? Because normally we were going as a group. We knew who the ulama were going to be that were going to join us. We knew that actually they were all of Hanafi fiqh, etc. But now this journey, we don't know who the scholars are, who the aima are, who the ulama are that are with us. So it's very likely that the people there might be of a different fiqh to us. The majority of people that are in, uh, in, in that area, especially in, in the Haramain, are, are either of Hanbali fiqh or uh, they might be Salafi. So it's important that you as a Hanafi person know what you need to do. So please make a note of this uh, or do bear this in mind. So on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, on the day of Arafat, what will we do? We will be praying Zuhr and Asr in their own time. So what is the time of Zuhr? You'll have noted it from uh, your stay in Mecca, in Masjid al-Haram. Just make a note, 12.23, it was in Ramadan. And that is when the start time of Zuhr is. And then 3.36 is the time of Asr. So you pray Zuhr at its time and you pray Asr at its time as well. Engage in personal worship, increase spirituality throughout the day. Uh, there is a special dhikr for Arafat which we've shared there. Pray the fourth kalima, pray Duru Sharif, pray Surah Ikhlas. Um, standing near Jabal al-Rahmah is desirable because that is what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. But don't go out of your way. Okay, let me go on a fact-finding mission. Where is this place? And then you're lost. So uh, wherever your group allocates you that this is where you're staying, it's absolutely fine for you to stay there and make your dua there as well. Uh, it's not necessary to, you know, to be near it. One may stand anywhere in the plains of Arafat and climbing the mountain. You might see some people are you know, going on an expedition of some sort. There's no need for any of that. Yeah? You can do that, I'm sure, in the streets of Blackburn or, uh, or elsewhere. You don't need to do any climbing. Um, you, you can stay uh, wherever you are near your camp and make dua in and around that area. Why? Because climbing the mountain, offering salah there, etc. has no virtue. And you can just see, if I just go back, um, that is the mount. But again, all of that is not necessary. Where Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood um, near the mountain, near the foot of the mountain. So if you can do that, that's fine. Otherwise, anywhere near your, uh, your camp is, is, is absolutely fine as well. So it's wajib to stay in Arafat until sunset. And then your stay in Arafat is now over. Just a point to note here again is once Arafat is over, what happens? People start to think, Chalo, Hajj done. Why? Because this is one of the main furs of Hajj, isn't it? So they start to hug each other and say, Mashallah, Mubarak Haji Sahib. No, 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 we've still got quite a long time to go yet. All we've done is day one, the stay in Mina. And now day two, which is the day of Arafat, which what have we done? We've paid Zuhr and Asr Salah and continued to make dua all throughout the day. 
the dua of a person on the day of Arafat is accepted. So please make dua for yourselves. Yeah, have this prep in your mind every day from now. Do some form of uh, practice. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Create a dua list that these are all the things that I will do. And inshallah, keep going. And look, the bottom line is you have to work on your own spirituality. You know that actually, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not 100% here. So what is it that's going to make you 100%? What is it that's going to make you cry? What is it that's going to make you have this feeling of ibadat and worship within you? Then do those things. If it's listening to bayanat, do that. If it's making dua, do that. If it is uh, listening to anashid, then do that. Those things that will be a means of spiritual increase for us, that is what we should be doing. So we've stayed in Arafat all the way till sunset. And now it's sunset. The stay of Arafat is now over. As soon as it's Maghrib time, we will not pray Maghrib in the plains of Arafat. Why? We will pray that once the time of Isha is in Muzdalifa. Now again, understand the hikmat. Once we put the clothing of Ihram on, those things that were halal for us, what did we do? We made? We made haram. Yes or no, bhai? Yeah, I was, it was perfectly fine for me to put perfume on. But once I put this ihram clothing on and I made the intention, recited talbiyah with it, it's now made haram upon me. In the month of Ramadan, what did I do? I'm fine to eat whatever I wish as long as it's halal throughout the hours of daylight. But as soon as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ramadan has set in, now what will you do? You will stay hungry from dawn to dusk. So what did I do? Exactly that. Likewise, in the plains of Arafat, exactly the same thing. The command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the medium of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, even though the time of Maghrib in, in Arafat has, has set, even though the time of Maghrib becomes Qadha, where will you still pray it? In the plains of? In the plains of Muzdalifa. Why? Because this is Allah's commands. Whatever Allah tells us to do, that is what we do. Not what we think is then the right or the wrong thing. So in this plane, just again a point of note, on the day of Arafat, we will not be praying Maghrib in Arafat. Rather, we'll start to leave for Muzdalifa. Even though Maghrib time is about to finish, we haven't reached, Maghrib, uh, we haven't reached Muzdalifa yet, no problem. Pray Maghrib and Isha in Muzdalifa at the time of Isha with one Adhan and one Iqama which we'll go through next. So, again, bringing back to our home slide. We started on the 8th in Mina. Usually walking, yes. But again, uh, so, the, so the distance between Arafat and Muzdalifa is not as large. But again, if, if you feel like you're tired and you want to go um, again this year, we don't know what that looks like. But it's again, whatever, whatever you feel is the right thing, you can do that. No, no. As soon as the time sets in, you can pray. So, where were we? Mina. We went from Mina on the 8th to Arafat on the 9th. And now the 9th, we spent all the way until sunset. We'll come on to that next. So, the 8th from Mina to Arafat. From Arafat, we've now gone to Muzdalifa. And what did we do so far? We said, the first point that I want you to note is, we're not going to pray, what here? We're not going to pray Maghrib in Arafat. We're going to pray that in Muzdalifa. So let's have a look, what does Muzdalifa look like? So the first thing again, just a point of note, Muzdalifa comes from the Arabic word Izdalafa or Izdilaf, which means a place of gathering. Uh, it's also, th th this place is also, uh, the, the root words are also Tazallafa, which means to spend a night here. So these are places that, um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions in the Quran. فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتٍ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ عِنْدَ الْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ So Mash'ar al-Haram is Muzdalifa. What will we do here? We will pray Maghrib and Isha in this place in the following manner. And again, this is something to note. With one Adhan and one Iqama, we will pray the Farz of Maghrib. One Adhan, so the Adhan will be called out if there's two, three of you praying Jamaat. Adhan will be called out. And then the Iqama. As soon as the Iqama is called out, we'll pray our Maghrib Salah. As soon as the Maghrib Salah is finished, we'll stand back up and then we will pray the Isha Salat. And obviously, if you're a traveler, then you will pray the two Farz of Isha, then read the Takbir al Tashriq, and then you will pray the Sunnats of Maghrib after Isha, and then the Sunnats and the Witr of, of Isha 
after the sunnats of Maghrib. So go in that order. Let me just stamp that in one more time. So one adhan, one iqama. We pray Maghrib. As we're standing up, remember the takbir al tashriq still carries on. So we do the takbir al tashriq as we're standing up. No adhan, no iqama for Isha. And then we pray Salatul Isha. And why am I saying this? Because we are of the Hanafi fiqh. Yeah, you might go there, you might see people doing all sorts. But this is the correct math method. And this is the only one time in the whole time of our lifetime will we need to gather and combine Salat. Where we will pray two Salat together. And that is the Salat of Maghrib and the Salat of Isha. So do not pray the sunnahs of Maghrib in between. We're going to pray Maghrib immediately after Isha. And then we will pray the sunnah, the witr, nafil of both the salats in order. And this is the time where we're also going to be spending, uh, like the brother just said there, the night will be spent in Muzdalifa and spent in some form of worship. You can see in big writing there, it'll say, Bidaya to Muzdalifa. Muzdalifa starts here and that is where you will stay. Yeah, so if you are Musafir, yeah, so the question is during the Hajj days, do you, are you going to be Musafir or are you going to be Muqeem? So if you intend to stay in Makkah for more than 15 days, you will be a, a Muqeem. You will be a person who will stay there and therefore you pray full. If it's anything less than that, then you will be a Musafir and you will pray Qasar Salat. Yeah, so um, again, the, the intention there should be that if there is a Jamaat going on, you can join. Uh, but otherwise, women don't necessarily need to join the, uh, the Jamaat that's going on. So if there is a Jamaat, fine for you to join. Otherwise, women can pray on their own. But you will follow the same methodology. Because uh, it's with Mujawid, um, say we don't find people with the same mm -hmm. Yep. So do we pray our own Namaz? You can pray your own Namaz, yeah. yes. Yeah, so you will, so if you can find somebody that's of the same pick as you, then you just appoint one person to do that. Jazakallah, good question. Yeah, so at the time of Isha, you pray your Maghrib and your Isha together. So you wait for the time of Isha to set in first. Correct. So good question again. So how do we pray the order of the... Let me just go back to that slide so you can see it. What is the order? We've shared it there. Pray all the sunnats with their nafil of both salats in order. So Maghrib farz, Isha farz, then Maghrib sunnat, then Isha sunnat and witr and nawafil. So we're in Muzdalifa now and then after this we'll take a short break because I want you to just uh, do some pair share um, and, and stamp in all of what we've shared from the 8th, 9th uh, and this night. So what are we going to do during the night? So number one we've said we're going to be uh, making sure that we spend this night in worship, some form of worship. But this is also a time to be collecting your pebbles for the next day. Why? Because on the 9th we're in Muzdalifa. On the 10th what are we going to be doing? We're going to be pelting the Jamarat. So in Muzdalifa, it's sunnah to collect your stones from here. You can do it near the Jamarat as well. You know, go there, have a look what's there. Get your, you know, 40, 70 or whatever you need um, and then collect them. But the sunnah is to do it from Muzdalifa. Don't worry, there will be enough to go around for everyone. Um, th there was a small bottle there yesterday. Um, and this is a good thing to do. Is take a bottle with you. Um, why? Because it's also sunnah to wash your, uh, wash your pebbles as well. So if you put them in a bottle, um, you know, just give it a little swirl um, therein and then empty, your, uh, empty, empty the water from inside it. And then you have a nice little, uh, mashallah, water bottle that has pea-sized stones. Yeah, not rocks, not the biggest thing that you can find there, uh, it, it, as you can see. So chickpea size, if you don't know what chickpea is, ask out home before you go. Uh, so something small uh, or smallish. And we're looking for 49 minimum. If you want to uh, take a few extra, then that's absolutely fine as well. Uh, up to 70. If you intend to pelt on the 13th as well, then you can take up to 70 because you'll then need them thereafter. We'll talk about the whole Jamarat uh, later on. So it's sunnah to collect 49 to 70 pebbles from this place. And then we've spent the entire night in worship. And now, remember, the night spending in Muzdalifa is sunnah. Yeah, that's something Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. But the wukuf and the stay starts when? After Fajr. After? After Fajr. So again, one more time. We're going to wait for the time of Fajr and we're going to offer it early. It's sunnah 
to offer it in ghalas. Ghalas means in darkness. So if uh, Fajr start time is 4 o'clock, then pray as early as possible because that is the sunnah to do. We've spent the whole night there, which was sunnah, and from now on is the wajib stay. It's wajib to make wukuf after Fajr in Musdalifah. So what will you do? You'll sit on your mattress or you'll sit wherever you are and you'll continue to make dua, continue to do dhikr, continue to pray Quran, any form of worship is absolutely fine. And then once the sunrise, uh, once the, the, the sun has come up and you know that the Fajr time is over, then you can leave Mina for what's now to come. And again, let me just show you some, uh, some, some pointers before we move on. First of all, stay near your group. Wait till Isha time to start if you get to Muzdalifa early. So remember, the, here what are we going to do? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. And that is, wait for Maghrib time to pass and recite Isha and Maghrib in Muzdalifa. Ensure there is proper segregation for men. What you don't want to do is men, women, men, women all together bunched up. If you know that actually this is where all the men are, then keep the men in one place and then the women can have separate um, se separate kind of sleeping arrangements and facilities and the other thing i'll make a note of here i know mufti hanif sub said run away uh, but no joke uh, it's, it's also important to to look after remember if you're going with dependents please keep them at ease why because their ease will then become your ease otherwise puri zindagi sunayenge aapko yeah so please make sure that what do you do you keep them at ease and comfort and make sure that they're, they're, they're your priority. If they feel like actually this is not a good time for me or not a good place for me to stay or whatever sleep or no problem. You make arrangements and you're the responsible person. So you make sure that they're absolutely comfortable. You put them in a place where they're fine, they're happy. If there's a number of women that are together traveling, then put them together. Um, and you know, you make separate arrangements for them. Ideally somewhere where it's not so claustrophobic with many men around you. And then you can see, sleep. Uh, with, with the other men folk on this side so make sure that there's proper segregation for them you can bring your sleeping bag foldable mat whatever else and make sure that your phone has sufficient charge because you may need to use your phone because from maghrib let's say it's at um, 7 30 maghrib you'll have left from arafat and all throughout the next day for the next 12 hours then you're not going to have a charging port or anything else. If you do need to get in touch with somebody, then you do so. And I'll mention, Mufti Hanif Sahib mentioned it really nicely yesterday, that look, if you know that your Instagram is going to disturb you, delete it before you go. If you know that you know, you're on this group and that group and whatever other group, and you're going to be bombarded with uh, all sorts of uh, messages, then get rid of it. If you know Sky Sports News and Transfer News and whatever else is going to bug you, can get rid of all of that stuff. Why? Because these are the things that then take your focus away from what you're doing. You're, you're, you're in your zone of ibadat and worship and then you get a notification, Sky Sports News, this is happening in the F1. Yeah? So all of these things that are going to take our focus away, get rid of them. Yes, we said if you have a phone, use the PDFs for the right things, then that, that's okay. But then don't get disturbed that actually my phone is my everything. Um, you know, use it for your alarm, use it for this, but make sure that we strike the balance there. This is what Muzdalifa looks like. Um, and, and we shared yesterday that Muzdalifa has a beauty of its own. You're sleeping under the night sky. Um, but do make sure that there's proper segregation there as well. And that is what the morning will look like. So you've spent the night and then the morning uh, looks like this. Because from now onwards, we're now about to complete the most important day of Hajj. So before we move on to the 10th, I'll leave this picture on. And I'll stop for two, three minutes. And if I can just ask you, with the person closest to you, and we'll, uh, if, if there are any refreshments, any water, anything else that you need, you can take. So I just want you to share with each other. One person, right-hand side person can go first. What happens on the 8th? The next person, what happens on the 9th? What happens in Muzdalifa? Just stamp your knowledge in, and then we'll move on to the 10th. Jazakallah. We'll start again at 3.07.
Okay, brothers um, and sisters, we'll start again. Um, round two. Okay, so a uh, few points of note. Let me go back to the uh, the slide that we shared earlier about the salat of Maghrib and Isha, which we're going to combine. So, first rule is we wait for the time of Isha to set in. Even though Maghrib becomes Gaza, fine. Once Isha time starts, let's say Isha is at 9 p.m. Isha time started. We'll then call out the Adhan for Maghrib and the Iqama for Maghrib. And then we will pray the three rakats of Maghrib namaz. Once we've done Salam for Maghrib, we'll pray the Takbir Tashriq as we're standing up. And then we'll pray our Isha Salat. Uh, if we're praying in Jamaat, then that's fine as well. So then Maghrib, Farz, as we're standing up, the Takbir and then the Isha Farz. Once we've done that, we've now prayed the Farz of Maghrib and Isha. We then do the Takbir. How do we then pray the Sunnats? So like we've just shared earlier, you then pray the Sunnats of Maghrib and the Nafil of Maghrib. So two Sunnat, two Nafil. Brother asked earlier, but if you're Musafi, you don't need to pray Sunnats. Correct, you don't. But you've got the whole night left. So whenever we shared yesterday on the slide, that whenever you have time, then you should pray Sunnats and you should pray your Nawafil. You've got the whole night here. So two sunnats of Maghrib, two nafil of Maghrib, and then you pray the two sunnats of Isha, two nafil of Isha, three witr of, uh, of Isha, and the two nafil of Isha. And then you can spend the whole night if you wish in, uh, in tahajjud. But one thing I will note here as well is that you don't want to you know, overexert yourself throughout the night there. Why? Because day 10 is very, very important. And that is what we're now moving towards. So, what have we done? Eighth, ninth, ninth night, and now we're going to Mina once again, and we're now going to be doing the main day. What happens normally on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah for the people at home? What is it? Eid day. But you're not going to be celebrating Eid just yet. Yeah, there's no Dar Chawal, there's no Biryani, there's no leg of lamb, you know, all of that will, will, will come later on. So, Yawm al-Nahr is the day of sacrifice. So this is what the 10th of Dhul Hijjah is known as. Why is this a very, very important and tasking day? Uh, and I'll just mention on the note here as well. All of these slides will be made available to you. Yeah? Um, so we'll add you on to the group and you can go through the whole PowerPoint at your leisure. So Yawm al-Nahr, the day of sacrifice. So first point is there are four acts to be carried out. Uh, from the 10th all the way to the 12th of Dhul Hijjah. Like I said, everybody else will be celebrating Eid at home. Your WhatsApp will be buzzing, but it won't be buzzing because you've deleted WhatsApp. Um, and, you know, everybody else will be saying Eid Mubarak, but you will be getting ready for a very, very important day ahead. And what is that? The first thing that you have to do is the Rami, the pelting. Then the animal sacrifice. And then number three, Halaq and Qasr. These three, you can see there, need to be carried out in sequence. So the first thing, Rami. Then normally what would happen is you'd phone the tour guides and say, I've done my Rami, do my Qurbani now. They've done the Qurbani, then you know, okay, I am now ready to do number three, which is the Halak. This year, we'll see how it pans out. But inshallah, you know, if you can, brother just shared there that put your foot down and say, according to the Hanafi Madhab, the Tartib is Wajib. And therefore, I want you to make arrangements of doing the Qurbani when I inform you and when I let you know. So Rami, pelting. Then the animal sacrifice and then the shaving of the head. And then italicized here, we put Tawaf is Yara. Tawaf is Yara is Farz. A point of note, if a woman knows or she thinks that my days of menstruation are going to start now, then what can you do? You can leave Rami, animal sacrifice and Halak and do Tawaf is Yara first. Why? Because this is a tip to note. 
that if you feel actually we're getting close and uh, then I'm going to have to wait for X amount of days, you can bring Tawaf e Ziyarat right at the right at the start. But obviously, if you feel that actually I'm okay, I'm fine to go for X number of days onwards, then you will carry on in this order. So Rami will be carried out on all three days. We'll talk about Rami now. The sacrifice, then the Halak, then the Tawaf, all of these need to be carried out by the 12th of Dhul Hijjah. So you have three days. And then number one, two and three needs to be done in sequence. You will see that there will be massive tunnels like this. Again, Tariqul Mushat, the path and the, uh, the, the motorway uh, for not motors, uh, for, for people. And you'll see en masse people, mashallah, walking in their droves, reciting takbir out aloud and savor these moments. Uh, you know, Mufti Hanif Sab touched upon touristic travel yesterday. You know, we trying to capture the moment. But instead of capturing the moment, we don't live the moment. So it's really important that when you're, uh, when, when you're traveling, then you know, put your phones on the side, do whatever you need to do, but be zoned in to a special worship that you're now about to undertake. So what have we done? We've gone from Muzdalifa, we spent the night there, and we've now reached into Mina once again, where the three Jamarat are. What are we going to do here? Let's take one at a time. We're going to be doing pelting. Rami means to pelt. Mina has three pillars that look like this. One, two, and three. Their names are Aqaba, Kubra, big, Wusta, middle, and Sughra, small. They all look the same. There's no width difference or weight difference to each of the pillars. Um, so, you know, don't, don't worry. But they will be clearly demarcated that this is the Sughra, the first one, then the Wusta, and then right at the end will be the Kubra, the third one. These places indicate the place where Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was tested by shaitan so when he took his son ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, and he said uh, allah ta'ala ordered him to uh, to sacrifice his son then this was the place where he he was tried to be he tried to be beguiled or shaitan tried to beguile Hazrat ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, and, and and then as a gesture of shunning him he then pelted him so we do the same thing this is the complex of what the jamarat looks like phenomenal build mashallah uh, and, and you know you can many many millions of people can pass by there there was one figure I was looking at that over three to four million people can be within that within that building at one given time it has over five floors from whichever floor you do your pelting is absolutely fine yeah so it goes from floor zero all the way up to floor five that is uh, an, another another aerial view you, you'll only realize once you come out the other end that actually I was on third floor or fourth floor or ground floor or first floor whatever else and then you'll go all the way down and carry on with your journey this is a good picture to show you the width and how big the Jamara is obviously you'll have seen pictures in the past where with just a pillar like this pillar but as the plasma screens in our homes have gone bigger the shaitan's also become widescreen hasn't it um, so, so there's, there's no shaitan that's chained there or locked up there or whatever else so that's just a demarcation of where, uh, where we need to do the pelting. So you'll see that people will come. This is the 10th. On the 10th, we're only doing the pelting of, of one shaitan, of one area. One tip that I will share with you and then I'll show you how to do it is as people are coming, so you'll come from this side. Mina is there, Mashir Haram is that side. So as you're coming, three pillars. The first one, the second one, and then the third one. So you miss the first two and then you come to the, you come to the third. And again, like I said, it'll be demarcated. A lot of people, as they're coming, the first thing that they see, okay, yep, shaitan, here we go, they'll start doing the pelting. But again, a top tip for you is as you carry on, you walk on towards this side, there's very, very few people. And you know, you can actually go as close as you wish and do your pelting there. So people, as soon as they see it, they do it, they start from this side. But if you walk on the other side, then there'll be a bit more space for you and you'll be able to do it nicely, inshallah. So let's talk about the pelting. We've talked about why we're doing the pelting. The rummy and the pelting is wajib upon both men and women. You can't do, I'm a bit tired, you tell your wife, could do my dike, sort it out, innit? just take seven more and do it for me as well. No, you can't appoint a proxy uh, to do your rummy unless obviously there's certain, uh, certain reasons which we, we're not going to go into, but we'll do it ourselves. So rummy is wajib upon both men and women. When you're about to do your rummy, the talbiyah, you're reciting all the way in the tunnels as you're coming to this pillar. Once you've come to the pillar, you stop the talbiyah and now you're going to be doing the throwing of the stone. It's sunnah to throw the stones with the right hand and say Allahu Akbar upon each throw. 
if the pebble lands in the enclosure that we've just shown you there then that is considered to be a valid throw so hand up like such right hand lift your hand a bit and then between your thumb and your finger in this manner and then you throw in bismillah allahu akbar oh allahu akbar allahu akbar and then in that manner you do all seven if somebody thinks i want all seven let me just like this and then just goes and drops them in that's not accepted as long as they fall within the enclosure that is considered to be a valid throw if it hits the pillar and rebounds out then you have to throw that stone again if somebody simply goes there and drops them like this that is not considered to be rami that's not considered to be pelting and we're throwing stones no nerf guns bb guns slingshots bow and arrow uh, chappal umbrella ke aaj to main uski chakkiya ura dunga none of that kind of stuff yeah we're going to be using the uh, the stones that we've collected at muzdalifa and we're going to be pelting the the the, the jamara there so one more time rami is wajib upon both men and women one should stop the recitation of tilbiya upon the first throw it's sunnah to throw with the right hand and say allahu akbar upon each throw as long as it lands in the enclosure it's a valid throw it's not necessarily to hit the pillar as long as it goes into the enclosure it's fine and then on this day you don't make dua every rami which we'll talk about mujahid sahib will take over in the next 10 minutes 1 2 3 whenever there's a rami afterwards you do dua after this one remember what did we do we skipped number 1 and 2 and we went to the third one so is there a rami after this so because there's no rami after this there's no there's no dua after this so it is sunnah to throw one pebble at a time as well and you'll see clearly you can't miss it that it'll tell you exactly what is the first one the sughra the wusta and the kubra some anybody eagle eyed to see what's the issue with this picture though left hand very good who says that mashallah excellent so um this is obviously again sunnah i don't know why they've done that maybe if we go to the authorities we should tell them to change the picture right um so uh, right hand not the left hand and he even demarcates for you is grayed out which one this one is so we said from mina you're coming from this side first second so cross cross and this is the third one that we're going to be hitting so what is the timing for the pelting again this is something to note So the on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah only the Jamara Aqaba will be pelted 7 times before sunrise is dislike to do so so make sure that you know exactly what time it is because the timing will change and I just want to stamp that in on the 10th of Dhul Hijjah the preferred time is sunrise to midday so from let's say sunrise is at 7 o'clock and midday is say 12:30 from 7 till 12:30 that's the preferred time to do it and again let me let me let me share this with you if you can't do it at that time there no problem you've got the whole the whole day ahead um and we've shared there that is disliked to do it before sunrise uh, midday to sunset is permissible to do after sunset to fajr is disliked however if there are lots of crowds or if you feel actually the uh, the mutawif people have told us to go at another time then that's no problem as well uh, it's okay for you to to de- to delay because of a reason and it won't be disliked as well however it must be done by the fajr so What did the 10th look like? Let's go back to this and then I'll hand over to Mufti Hanif sir. On the 10th, what have we done? Number 1, we've done the rami. We've pelted. Then the second thing is the animal sacrifice and then finally we do the halaq before we are about to do tawaf e ziyara. So, we've done the rami of only one. Now we do the animal sacrifice. It is wajib to perform an animal sacrifice. This is called dam ash-shukr. Why? Because those of us that are going beforehand will have performed umrah and then will have performed hajj. The fact that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala allowed us in one journey to do two. That's why we're doing tamattu. What does tamattu mean? To take benefit. So because we've done tamattu, it's wajib to do the sacrifice the, the animal slaughter and again the animal slaughter is usually done by the group if you go on the mutawif website it's part of the package but again stamp in where you can that you'll only do it once we tell you one way may slaughter the animal himself if the group allows you again you might want to take a note of this where the europa camps are right at the back there's a place called al muaisim yeah mim ain ya sad mim that is the official abattoir of mina and you can actually go there a few years ago we went there we slaughtered ourselves uh, and and that's perfectly fine again if you can go there then alhamdulillah if you can't go there alhamdulillah as well 
So one may slaughter the animal himself or have someone else slaughter it. Although, what? Uh, so, so the other point is, so we've done the qurbani there. What about the normal qurbani that we do at home, right? Um, the, the, the qurbani of being wealthy. So what happens with that? Although one may be a traveler, if he has the means, he should also carry out the wajib qurbani that he does at home. So just indicate to somebody uh, that actually the normal qurbani, you know, one share costs X amount of pounds, then do that for me as well. And then finally, the third thing is halaq, shaving of the hair is wajib. A person will be free from the restrictions of ihram once he has now shaved his head. Obviously, there's one thing remaining, which is that last bit. The only thing that is not allowed is to be intimate with one's wife until after tawaf is yarat. So what did we do? We did the pelting. Then the animal sacrifice. And now the third thing is the halak and the shaving of the head. And now we will then move on to doing tawaf is yarat. What's that? Sorry? Yeah, so wherever you see barbers, you can do it there. G. No, no, that's fine. That's, you can, no problem. There, there's no, you don't have to wait for the one at home. That can happen at its own time. After Rami, you're now going to carry on the journey. So we've done Rami. Then you make arrangements for your Qurbani to be done. After the Qurbani is done, you now get your head shaved. And now you can either do Tawaf is Yarat straight away. Or you can wait and wait until the 10th evening, 11th, 12th. You have until the 12th evening to do. So you can see, yeah. So the nights, Mufti Hanifsa will speak about, the nights is Sunnah to spend in Mina. Yeah. No, no, no. They, they, there's so many different ones. Is part of. Uh, again, that those technicalities you'll have to ask them when they go. Where is it done? What's going on? Where's the place? So uh, that, yeah. So if they've said to you that it's within the boundaries, it's fine. You take their word for it. You don't need to then become. Yeah. Yeah. Then you have to arrange for it. Yes. Normally, what happens is you have a number. You phone the number and say, I've done my Rami. And then within two hours, they'll say to you, your sacrifice is done. And then you can shave your head. Okay. So, we've now moved on to the final part, which is Tawaf is Ziyara. On the 10th, you can delay this from the 10th to the 11th to the 12th. Sometimes what happens, you'll see that the most public will be on day one, which is this day. Yeah, day one of the Tawaf is Ziyara. Um, but it's fine for you to do it afterwards if you have family with you or you feel like you're a bit tired no problem you can rest um, and then uh, you can do tawaf later on so it has to be performed between the 10th and the 12th of Dhul Hijjah it's preferable to perform tawaf is yara after until tawaf is yara is not permitted you cannot be intimate with your spouse and every element of Hajj can be performed in one's menses except tawaf so remember if a lady is in her menstruation she can do the stoning she can make, she can do the animal sacrifice, she can cut her hair. The only thing that is not allowed for her to do, as you can see there, is, um, is the tawaf is yara bit, which we will talk about. So if a woman cannot perform tawaf is yara due to menstruation, then there is no penalty for her in delaying, even if its time has passed. Sunset on the 12th of Dhul Hijjah. So first thing, if you know that your days are soon, the first thing that I'll mention is, and I think the question came yesterday for the, from the sisters, is try to... Time your, your stay where you will get enough time after Tawaf is Yarat. Like, let's say if the menstruation period is seven days, then it will give you enough time. If you were to come on, then you have some time at the end where you can do it. That's the ideal and the preferred method. If you feel that actually um, it's not going to work out the way you want it to work out, then it's fine if a doctor tells you or if you feel from your own experiences that by taking the pill I can stop it then that's okay as well. And the third option that I've given you is, you can then bring in Tawaf is Ziyarat on the 10th, if that helps. So if you feel like actually, I might start today, tomorrow, or the next, whatever, then you can do 10th Dhul Hijjah, you can do your Tawaf is Ziyarat immediately. And again, don't think to yourself, you know, as the man, okay, no man, I want to do Tartib of one, two, three, then four. Remember, you always give priority the other way. 
So, if a woman cannot perform tawaf ziyara due to menstruation, there is no penalty for her in delaying it, even if its time has passed. All the rules of ihram are uplifted after tawaf ziyara. And again, remember during that tawaf, what will we be doing? Exactly the same. Seven rounds, do istiqbal first, then istilam. Seven rounds of the Kaaba. Because, you, because you've done halak now, you might be in your normal day-to-day -day jibba. So, are we going to do iztiba? Take our, none of that stuff, yeah? But you will do ramal because that's possible to do. So you will do ramal in your normal clothing. After the tawaf, then you will perform sa'i. Sa'i, remember, any tawaf that has a sa'i after it, you will do iztiba and ramal. But here we can't do iztiba, so we will do ramal there. Sa'i is a wajib element of the hajj. The preferred time for this is after tawaf is ziyarat. There is an option of doing it earlier. If a person performs this sa'i after tawaf is ziyarat, he will perform ramal in the first three rounds. There's no istiba. This sa'i can be performed in any of the hajj days on the condition that there is a tawaf done before it. Mufti Hanif Sab, I'll now hand over to you to take us through to 11, 12, 13th of Dhul Hijjah. Jazakallah. If there are any questions, inshallah, like we said, we'll, we'll take them happily. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-karim So alhamdulillah we've gone from day 8 8th of Dhul Hijjah 8 9 10 and now we'll be moving on to the 11th Just one thing sorry we forgot was that at the beginning when putting on the ihram we began with talbiya and when we were discussing about umrah we said we'll continue to say the talbiya right until when we are about to begin the tawaf so here now we will continue to say the talbiya on the eighth whilst we're in mina the ninth where we are in arafat and muzdalifa right until when we'll reach mina just about to pelt the jamara so until then we'll continue with our talbiya also just to make things slightly easy I think announcement was made uh, about the distribution of these and I think they've got limited copies. So perhaps they've been distributed amongst the sisters. So for those who may have come by themselves and assuming that there won't be a copy distributed to their family member or so and they want one of these copies, then we can just have them distributed right now. The reason being is that it might be slightly helpful on one of the sides is how to perform Umrah. So it's in steps. Before Ihram, after putting on the Ihram, going to Makkah, performing Tawaf, performing Sa'i, cutting the hair. So that was what was discussed yesterday. As for this may be helpful for you to understand what we've been discussing so far. So there's a breakdown of each day. 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th and 13th. So Alhamdulillah, so it's a whole page when you'll have a clear understanding of Alhamdulillah what has already been explained. A summary of 8th Dhul Hijjah, then a summary of what was discussed about on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah, and then Alhamdulillah, as you'll be able to see, we've reached the end of the 10th of Dhul Hijjah. Now we're moving on to the 11th. So it's just easier to have everything on a single page. So for those who do have it, can always just use it to follow us through where exactly we are. So Alhamdulillah, we've discussed 8, 9, 10. You've done all the main rituals of Hajj. Now the rest of the days are just relaxing. There's literally nothing to do. On the 8th, you're in Mina, but you were anticipating Hajj and you were really worried. You had so many questions. You weren't sure whether what will happen where. On the 9th, you're in Arafat, Muzdalifat, slightly inconvenience, but again, an amazing spiritual experience. 10th, as I explained, is the busiest day. Whilst everyone else in Preston elsewhere is rejoicing, making Eid. Obviously for us, they'll be pelting the Jamara, then moving from there to our tent, then to the place of sacrifice if needs be, or we'll be awaiting the call or information, and then going all the way to Makkah, possibly walking there to do the Tawafu Ziyarah and to do Sa'i there. Now, if a person cannot do Tawafu Ziyarah and Sa'i on the 10th, Fine, better to do it earlier on the 10th. If 10th is not possible, then the, the 11th. If that's not possible, then the 
the Maghrib, the sunset of the 12th. If unfortunately you are not able to do it by then, you would still have to do it, but you'll have to slaughter a sheep, a goat. It's known as dumb, which we will discuss that later. As for explain the women folk, if for some reason they can't do it on the 10th, they can do it on the 11th, if not 12th. And if it's because of menstruation, they had to delay to 14, 15, 16, no problem. As explained, there's no dumb. So 11th and 12th, we're not doing anything if we've, alhamdulillah, done our tawafu ziyara and sa'i. So basically, we're simply in Mina. And when the appropriate time comes, we'll travel, you'll have to walk from our tents where the camps are, all the way to where these three pillars are, and seven, seven, and seven. That's the only thing. Now, as discussed, there are many changes going to take place. And there's different exclusive options as well as part of Hajj. And as far as I can remember from reading, there's platinum, the silver, the gold. And the highest level means obviously you pay more, but there's some luxuries, including the camps are the most closest to Jamarat, as far as I've been informed. So therefore, it'll be very easy. So before it was distributed according to where you came from. European tents were different, Middle East, um, a subcontinent. Now I think it's about how much money you're willing to pay and that's where the camps may be situated. But nevertheless, we're happy. Even if it's a long walk, it won't be as much. You travel in a group safely, Alhamdulillah, it will be comfortable. So, now where did I leave that? So we've discussed that and the order as well. We don't need to worry so much. You'll see the flow of the people you just move in the direction uh, of the uh, flow. So time for pelting on the 11th and 12th of Dhul Hijjah. Now on the 10th, that was the first day when we only pelted one Jamara. One. And we all know because everyone will be rushing to that one. The other two will be abandoned. But that was allowed right from the morning. All throughout the day. And if needs be, although it may be disliked for no reason, then even at night. But 11 and 12 is very different because it is not permissible to pelt the Jamarat any time before Zawal, before Zahar beginning time. So if someone wakes up in the morning, Fajr goes to sleep and assumes 7, 8, 9 o'clock, let's just quickly get it out of the way. Well, that's not possible. We have to wait until, and Zawal, Zawal beginning time will be around 12 o'clock or so. Now, we have had issues before, wherein, in order to control the crowd, they've closed the gates of some of the camps. And because of which they've had a time, for example, 10 till 3 o'clock, the boundary around the European camps will be closed. So some people leave their camps at 3 o'clock, assuming we'll go there, we'll wait until 12, half 12, then we'll pelt, and then we'll return rather than going after Asar or so. But then in not knowing so, they'll walk, 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 walk. They reach there by half 11, they've pelted, they've returned, only to realize that they had done so before Zawal, before Zahar time. If so, it's not permissible. They'll have to go again and pelt them again. And if unfortunately they don't have enough time to do that, that we will discuss could be a dumb. So we need to make sure Again, we're not doing anything on 11 and 12. Aram, you're resting in Mina, you're doing Ibadat, reciting Quran, Dhikr, Dua. You're only pelting this Jamarat. For that, you need to know that is done after Zohar time sets in, after 12 o'clock or so. So Rami is not permissible before midday Zawal on the 11th and the 12th. So first day was allowed, not on the 11th and the 12th. The time for pelting on the 11th and 12th and 13th is after Zawal. Now 13, we will discuss afterwards, but ideally on 11 and 12 if, is from Zohar time until Maghrib. Now after Maghrib, it's allowed if a person has not been able to do so, but it's a dislike, right until the next day, Subah Sadiq. It is permissible to perform the Rami after sunset until Fajr, if it is difficult to do so during the day. Although it'll be disliked, but if for some reason, you had family members, they're very elderly, or because the system is changing, they say, sorry, we've now distributed, allocated certain times for certain camps. So then even at night, it'd be fine. But once you do the Rami, and again, you don't need to worry at all, which Rami comes first, second, third. Go with the flow, and automatically you'll see the first one, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, then briefly stop to make dua. You only stop to make dua briefly if there is another pelting afterwards. So the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, brief dua, move on to the next one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's still a third one left, brief dua, move on to the third one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, since there's only three, there's none other after that, we just quickly return back to our tents. So return to one's tent in Mina and engage in worship. Sometimes it may be better when we were collecting the pebbles in Muzdalifah, have small bags. One for the tenth. So how many do you need for the tenth? Anyone? Seven, because you'll only be pelting one Jamara. Jamara, the stone pillar representing Shaitan. So in one bag, so you don't, you're only carrying for the tenth. Mark it, highlighter, marker, tenth. The other one, have another small bag, mark it eleventh. And just have how many in there? Quick maths, 21, 7, 7, 7. So in the next day, you don't need to worry. All right, this is our 21. And then for the 12, again, you mark it 12 and then you put 21 inside. Yes, on, you may want some on the side just in case something may have had happened. Now, after 12, you will see many people start going. 80%, 90% of the public. But it's sunnah to remain an additional day, 13th as well, which I will discuss but if we remain on the 13th, we'll have to do all three again. So then you'll have to prepare back for another 21. So 7 on the 10th, then 11, 12, 21, 21. And if you're going to remain on the 13th, 21 again. So it's sunnah to spend the nights, although it may be convenient for others to go back to their hotel in Mecca. We've performed tawaf ziyara, and sa'i, we're tired, let's have a rest. We'll go tomorrow morning. What is there in Mina anyway? Some people assume that. What is there in Mina anyway? You just need to pal the three Jamarat. Otherwise, will you just be sitting there? So sit at the hotel in Mecca or sit in Medina, um, Mina. What difference does it make? Well, it does. Because here we're following Sharia. We're following the commandments of Allah and His Messenger. So if here the command is and recommended practice and the Sunnah is to reside in Mina, yes, we will forsake staying in Mecca, being in front of the Kaaba and be here. Because again, we've been prescribed to follow the Sharia here. So again, this is another view. So on the 12th, we'll do exactly as the 11th. Do nothing at all. Aram, Ibadat, worship, dhikr, dua. And after Zawal, after the beginning time of Zohar, we will set off to do the pelting of all three. Now you can go straight immediately after Zawal. You can go after you prayed your Zahar. You can go just before Asr. Now, as we said, there could be particular timings, but any timing, but ideally you want to do it before Maghrib. Any action remaining from the 10th must be completed before the sunset of the 12th. Now this means if you are, able, if you are meant to do the pebble hitting on the 10th, all day pass by, the night pass by, 11th comes and you've not done it for some reason. Or all 11th passes by and you still couldn't do it on the 11th. Then you try and cover it up until the Maghrib of the 12th. If you, if you can, since you've delayed the day, there will be a dumb penalty. And after the 12th of Dhul Hijjah sunset, then there's no Qadha concept, but you'll have to give a penalty. But again, you'll hear this in the next few slides, penalty, penalty, penalty. You don't need to worry so much. We're only covering some of the stuff just in case. Otherwise, you will see that everything will flow in its place. So if one does not leave Mina and stays there until Subah Sadiq break down, Fajr beginning time, which is the beginning time of Fajr, then Rami becomes wajib to perform on the 13th. So simply saying, we stayed on 11th. We still did 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all three. We remained in Mina. 12 comes, now 12 could be your last day, 8, 9, 10, 11 and we say 5 days of Hajj. We began on 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. Basically what they recommend is, we're waiting until Zohar time. Now take all your baggage because you're going to travel lightly and go with your luggage to pelt. Why? Because once you've pelted, now you can go back to Makkah. You don't need to come back. But if you've left your belongings there, it simply means you're traveling from your tent if it's far all the way to 
where you need to pelt. Now you're returning all the way just to pick up your luggage and going all the way back to Makkah, which is on route anyway. It may be convenient, but otherwise, if it's possible, then just have your bag travel from your camp to the, the Jamarat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Straight, go back Makkah. That's it, it's done. Everything's over. Uh, and there's one other ritual left which we will discuss. But that's 80, 90% of our public will be doing that. Waiting for that Zohar time. Once that Zawal, Zohar time begins, then they'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, pelting, and they'll go back Makkah for however long you're going to remain there. However, it is Sunnah and it is recommended that if you can remain one day behind in Mina. Now, if you're still in Mina on the 12th, and Maghrib time happens. Now it's makru to go back to Makkah and to do Rami and go back. Now it's better that remain in Mina until the next day and do another set of three pelting, then go Makkah. But if you're still there, let's say Isha time, and you thought, no, I need to go pack up, I need to go, and you were to do the pelting and you went away, that's fine. But if the 13th Fajr time comes, which is not going to be the likelihood really, unless you're intending. But if the Fajr of 13th is there and you're still in Mina, now you have to do the extra three peltings. But the flexibility on this day is that you can do it anytime, anytime after Fajr time kicks in. Although it's disliked to do it from then till Zawal. Better is again the 13th as well. Better is remain all the way until Zawal time then do your three, then leave for Makkah. But the flexibility is that in the, unlike 11th and 12th, remember we said 11, 12, you can't even do it before Zohar time, but on the 13th, if you were to do it, it would be valid. Again, those slides explain the, uh, that as well, and inshallah, it will be shared with you. So 13th of uh, Dhul Hijjah, it's optional to stay, it's rewarding, it's desirable virtues to spend an extra night in Mina for the 13th, Timing for Ramiz, as we said, from Fajr beginning time till Zawal. If you were to do it, fine, you're free now, go back to Makkah. But it's not preferred. Better is the normal timing between Zohar and Maghrib. And the time of pelting ends with Maghrib time. If by then you haven't done it yet, then you'll just have to give a dumb, a penalty, which we will discuss. If one does not intend to stay for the additional day on the 13th, leave before the Maghrib of the 12th. So now, Alhamdulillah, we've completed that ritual. There's another sunnah generally said in the books, which means to stop at Wadi uh, Muhassab, but that comes on the route anyway. As we're traveling from Mina to Makkah, we happen to pass by. That's where Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam settled there for a few moments and intended there to settle. And there is a history behind its significance that it was the same spot where the kuffar of Makkah plotted against Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba to assassinate, to persecute them. Then Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, we will settle there and show them the glory of Islam. This was the very same place wherein they sat and they consulted each other to oppose Allah and his messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba. Today, now the Muslims have conquered this place. So it shows the magnificence and the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the last ritual, now alhamdulillah, you're a haji sahab, you've done it. But the only the last thing now remains is the farewell tawaf, tawafu wada So this could be done anytime after you've done your tawafu ziyara, the tawaf of the hajj. It's wajib, it can be performed anytime after tawafu ziyara. However, a woman is excused. Let's say if she had alhamdulillah, she's done all her rituals, she also did her tawafu ziyara, Right on the 12th, she experiences menstruation. Now when she comes to, back to Makkah, she needs to leave for home in the next two days. And she's still in her state. Then she's not obliged to do this tawaf al-wada. Otherwise, everyone else, it's wajib upon them. So if they were not to do so, then there's a penalty. So even now, some people assume, as explained, tawaf al-wada is the farewell, you're bidding farewell. And you're supposed to express regret, remorse that 
I was so fortunate to visit to sight the Kaaba. I'm going, oh Allah, don't make it my final visit. Allow me to come again and again. That's why they say, don't even show your back towards the Kaaba. But return with your chest, with your face, so that your gaze is upon the Kaaba until the very last moment. So you're expressing grief and sorrow. But this ideally needs to be the last ritual before you're returning home or going Medina and from there home. However, if, for example, coach is delay and you happen to assume that you're going to leave for Zohar, now your coach now is scheduled to leave after Isha, so you're still a couple of hours there. Then some people assume we can't go to Masjid Haram anymore. We can't see the Kaaba anymore because I've already bid the farewell. I've already done the tawaf. Oh, I'll have to do another one. That's not the case. Once you've done the niyyah, you've done a tawaf, after tawaf was ziyara, that automatically becomes your farewell tawaf. Even after tawaf al wada, now you may go there, you may even do extra tawafs, uh, you may even pray salah there, etc. Now, alhamdulillah, we've done the rituals, and afterwards, if you have a look at uh, this, then it just simply becomes easier. 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th. 8th, we went to Mina. Did we do anything? No, bus, relax. Nothing on 8th. 9th, we went to Arafat and Muzdalifa. We only went to those places, never did anything physical. 10th was busy. Rami, slaughtering the animal, Halak Qasar, going Makkah, Tawaf, Sa'i, and we came back to Mina. 10th. 11, 12, 13, Aram, do nothing except for pelting. So it's really easy. It's not difficult at all. Obviously, it becomes very difficult with all these different concepts all at once. But otherwise, we do not need to worry. It's only one or two days where there's lots of stuff to do. That's Alhamdulillah, it's over now. However, in the next few slides, we'll try and summarize the more dry topics, daunting topics, which people don't want to hear. That's like penalties, penalties, penalties. And people become really confused when they hear about, will I have to do a penalty? Will I have to do slaughter this? Now, we would have ideally, and in some of the kitabs, they won't even discuss this because it just gets slightly confusing and people become really paranoid unnecessarily. But we're only going through this because of few things that we know to stay away from. And since now, whether you have access to scholar or not, so at least it's the right questions to ask that I did this. I'm sure I've heard something about this concept then contact you're always going to contact an alim that's why alhamdulillah will provide that provision facility that whilst you're there as well on whatever uh, so, uh, uh, whatever means there is uh, you will be able to contact and ask questions and at the same time have some contacts like some ulama some muftis that you know back at home any issue comes you can always ask them hopefully inshallah there'll always be some ulama there as well traveling but if needs be that you have someone uh, as a contact so next few slides let's just go through some penalties now when we when we're discussing there's a penalty there's a penalty it could be any of these four badana you're in trouble there badana means you have to slaughter big animal now there's only two cases where you would have to slaughter big animal one case it won't so happen so i won't discuss that but one is applicable and that is uh, uh, we touched upon very important since now people may not even choose their selected dates now you, what if a woman is in the state of menstruation on the 10th of dhul hijjah so can she enter the masjid no can she do the tawaf no 10th she can't 11th she can't 12th she can't she stays behind until she attains purity on 13, 14, 15, and does the tawaf sa'i fine, no penalty. What if her date starts on the 9th, for example, and she has a habit of nine days of hayd? And obviously, women will know more about this mas'ala. So she comes on on the 9th, and she has a habit of nine, of nine days. So 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and on the 15th, was scheduled to return home. Sorry, we need to return home. We can't do anything about it. What's the problem now? The problem is she's not done her tawafu ziyara yet and she's not even stopped bleeding yet. So she's in a dilemma. What do we do? Now, the actual answer is remain. 
you must now remain there right until when the state of purity is achieved even if that means after another two three additional days and do the tawaf and say that's the actual masala that she must do and there will be no additional penalty for that however if she's going to Medina then if she were to go to Medina then we will say can you return and do your tawaf if possible delay going Medina and stay there and then do your tawaf if you can't delay going Medina you're only there for three days the whole tour is going there the hotels have been booked the family is going there then go there and just come a day before you fly from Jeddah or something and do your tawaf or ziyarah if the woman has until that point reached purity. So she must stay behind for that. Obviously the question now is, what if that's not possible? She needs to leave. She scheduled Jeddah airport flight back to come home. She can't delay the flight. First, first we'll say delay the flight. Now if she doesn't delay, if she goes off without doing tawaf or ziyara firstly her hajj is incomplete secondly like discussed that once you took did halak and qasar on the 10th everything is allowed cutting the hair clipping the nails applying perfume covering the face there's one thing not allowed which is intimacy between husband and wife that is one thing that is not allowed it's haram and forbidden until the tawaf is done. Now, if she returns home, her hajj is incomplete and their relationship, their interaction, their intimacy is forbidden. So we'd say, go book another flight and go all the way back. So that's how severe it is. Now, you may think I'm taking a few minutes, but obviously women will be able to appreciate it more, but because it's such an important masala. So either we'll say, delay the flight. They say, sorry, we can't do that. Because that means the whole family has to stay behind. There's no hotel bookings. It's going to cost us so much as well. Another thing is, they should seek consultation with a doctor, specialist. They'll know through their own body experience, taking the pill to postpone the menstruation. Now again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a specialist, and so I won't be recommending it for everyone. But the kitabs have that. Like, if that means they would need to delay the days and take the pill, then do so. Some women, even after doing so, they may suffer from menstruation. Allah knows best. As for some women, it may actually work. That's the background of what should ideally happen. That they should not leave Makkah until they've done their tawaf and say. However, if you were to tell me, not possible. She's tried taking the pill. Again, menstruation has come. Or... Definitely not for her because previously when she didn't so, doctor said completely no, it's disrupted the whole system in the body and she suffered from many side effects. So she's not going to do that and that's not possible. Delaying the flight, never, never. That's not possible. The cost, people are leaving. Now what's the option? There's only one other option left. And that option is not recommended because it's a sinful option. But if a person finds themselves in that position wherein she's in menstruation, she must return home. What is she going to do? If she happened to go to the masjid and do her tawaf and sa'i, it will be done. It will be completed. So now the intimacy afterwards will be allowed. Hajj will be done. But because she entered the masjid and did tawaf, in the state of major impurity when she should have not she will be sinful and there is a big penalty and that's a badana large animal and just yesterday i was looking at a website at the prices although you may get something cheaper than that but camel was 1500 pounds equivalent and these animals need to be slaughtered in the harem boundary again if you're worried what if i need to do dumb small animal or so there are many provisions there you contact them, they'll make arrangements for you. You wouldn't need to go there. You make the payment, they'll slaughter it. But can you imagine 1,500 pounds or so? That's a common. Cow, I was looking at 1,250 pounds or so. So even if you were to get a bargain, 1,000 pounds. Now you might think it's not worth it. We'd rather delay the flight or so. So that's a big mas'ala. And generally so previously when we would book 
our flights, we would take all this into consideration after consulting the spouse, the daughter, the mother, etc. But we'll have to be mindful of that. Again, I wouldn't have ideally discussed that, but it's a big mas'ala. And even if there was a difference of opinion, we could have seen and explored that. But this mas'ala we need to be mindful of that she needs to have done the tawaf in a state of purity before people leave. There's another dumb, we'll discuss that um, about slaughtering a small animal, sheep, goat, that'll be costing about 150 pounds. And then sadaqa, which is mostly the case sadaqa, sadaqatul fitr, that's 20 riyals, 3 4 pounds or so. And sometimes there's less than sadaqatul fitr, 40 50 pence. But again, We'll quickly go through badana. We've already said having relations with one spouse anytime between wukuf of Arafah and halak. That's not going to be the case because you've only got one night in between. That is of Muzdalifa and I doubt there's going to be intimacy there because families, people will be separated. So don't get over confused with one. Number two, performing tawaf ziyara in the state of major impurity. That's what we're discussing here. Now dumb. Again, as we go through this exhausting list, which it isn't, but you might think there's so many things because of which we may need to slaughter an animal additional 150, 170 pounds. You'll see many of them will never be applicable. But we're doing so that it remains in the head, there's this concept. Being intimate with one spouse, particularly important, newlywed. Many a time newlyweds have gone for hajj, holding hands or so. Leave the holding hands for afterwards, no disrespect. You don't know each other for these few days. Keep a distance. Now, I literally mean it also, but not that you don't know each other. The reason being so is that if they were to even touch hands and these feelings of lust, passion, they'll be them. Kissing, touching should be avoided. If it, and obviously no one may have a control over it. So therefore, yes, the act of Direct intimacy is not allowed. Similarly, any action by which it arouses those passions. Now, to a male wearing normal clothing for an entire day or night, likewise half a day and half a night, which is about 12 hours. That ties in with number four as well. Yesterday we discussed about masks. And Alhamdulillah, today was discussed again. That's at least a quota of the face covered. So if that is covered for 12 hours continuously, then you would have to slaughter goat or sheep. But if it's only for few hours here and there, then you only have to give sadaqa. And as I told you, sadaqa is equivalent to sadaqatul fitr, what we normally give at the end of Ramadan. So you want to, at the end of Hajj, want to give some number of riyals anyway, you know, just so that Allah accepts it, 20, 25, 30 riyals. Now this can be done anywhere. Slaughtering of the animal has to be done in the haram, in that proximity. But giving the money can be done anywhere. So if that means that you've got some relatives in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, elsewhere, and you were to ring them normally, you give your money there and say distribute this much amongst the poor. Or you went on internet and you know some reliable charities from here. And if you were to just make that donation, that's fine as well. Or there are many poor people in Makkah, Mukarramah, and Medina, Munawwara. Do search for them. Alhamdulillah, there are many people who are trying to facilitate. We will get double the reward on spending on the people of Medina and the people of Makkah. There are many poor people who are entitled to zakat. Go out of your way and try to spend on them. And there'll be extra reward. And subhanAllah, just a few days ago, I was actually reading, although many people won't want to hear this, but it said in the kitab that when going on the journey of Hajj, to even bargain is makruh. We all love bargaining. Yeah, we all love that, obviously. Um, although this is a side note, but just on a side note, because we d we've been doing lots of learning. I can remember when I was young, um, went for Umrah. And for those who have been there will know that previously, it was like you'd bargain for anything, even a shoelace. Because even a shoelace costing two yards will suddenly be, you're from Europe or South Africa, 50 riyals for you. So you'd bargain for everything. So we're in that routine. We went to Makkah, Medina, everything we'd bargain. 20 riyals, no, 1 riyal. Then perhaps we could end up getting it for 3, 4, 5 riyals. So I was in that mode, like 4 weeks we were in Umrah, bargaining everywhere. Then came 
uh, England, came to Blackburn, and I must have gone to the town. And I think Greenwoods, is that what it's called? Greenwoods, the store. It was there anyway, I don't even know if it's there. I just happened to go there, I don't know how I went there. And it's that mode, four or five weeks, what you've been doing is bargain, bargain. So I said, how much is that for? He must have said something like 30 pounds. I said, what if I give you 20 pounds? <laughs> but guess what? <laughs> he said, okay, I'll give you a discount of 10, 20% stuff. And I'll put in some of these socks and everything for you as well. It worked. And he goes, well, you don't ask, you don't get. So here, you get it. Obviously, after that, I was really embarrassed. I never did so. But the idea is that you're so in the routine of things, then you realize you're out of place and you're not meant to do bargaining. There is a set price. That was a side note. Nevertheless, in the kitab, it said, Makru to bargain because here, the more money you spend, you're cultivating the land in the year after you're harvesting there, you'll be rewarded for it. So again, there, they could be poor people. So, fine, we all want to bargain, we're not going to throw our money away, but if that means that which are this poor man and woman, their livelihood is based on that, what difference does it make if I give two additional reals or five additional reals, if the jabba is costing two more? If I, with the correct intention, spend on the people of Makkah and Medina, inshallah Allah will multiply for me. So, we discussed that, um, shaving a quarter or more of the hair or beard, that won't happen, you won't deliberately sit there, but there's two possibilities. If your slaughtering of the animal hadn't been done yet, and by mistake, you remove the hair, then you would have to do them. So you have to wait until your animal has been slaughtered. And the other situation is many people ask, I think one of the questions I'll take uh, afterwards was, what if a lot of people, when they're doing wudu or so with their beard, strands of hair come out, or they're scratching and itching. Now, obviously, that's not a quarter. Coat of the beard won't fall. Few hair. So don't worry unless you intend to. Uh, but so they won't be a dumb. And you won't pluck it. If you pluck it intentionally, then there's sadaqatul fitr. Three, four, five pound equivalent. But if it just happens to fall by itself or just scratching or so, then you don't need to give anything. But if you want to give 40, 50 pence or so for one or two hair, just give two, three pounds at the end of Hajj. But there's no big penalty. And even that, you want to give few pounds, just in case. Clipping the nails, we won't do that anyway. Not doing tawaful wada. Remember, the woman on hayd on menstruation is excused, but for the rest of the people, that 10, 11, 12, on the 12th, you're leaving Makkah and you forgot to do another tawaful wada, then would it be a dam? And if any of the wajib of hajj was missed out, that means pelting the jamarat or doing sa'i. That's why when we started this session, we spoke about what is furs, what is wajib. Now, furs and wajib both are necessary. But the difference is if you don't do a furs, it just doesn't count. Like in namaz, ruku, sajra, qiyam might be a rukun. Furs, if you don't do, your namaz doesn't count. But wajib is something, it's necessary. But if you didn't do it, it will be done, but you'll have to compensate for it. Like in namaz, if we miss out a wajib, Namaz will be done, but we compensate for it by giving, by doing sajda to sahwa. So here as well, if you didn't do sa'i, or you didn't pelt the rami, or you didn't have enough pebbles, or you forgot or so, then there will be slaughtering of an animal. Now, sadaqa, when do we give sadaqa? By sadaqa, we mean equivalent to sadaqa tul fitr, three, four pounds or so. If few hairs deliberately you pluck, but less than a quarter, which again, you won't be doing so anyway. Clipping one or two nails, applying perfume to a little portion of the body. Now, okay, that's an interesting one. Because many people ask about creams, lotions, and many other things. Which I think is one of the questions that I'll discuss then. Uh, but if you were to apply a cream to a little part of the body, and it's not a fragrance, you're doing it because of dry skin or so. If you were to do little, then it's only sadaqah. It's only if you were to do it consistently a number of times covering the whole limb, then they would be dumb. But again, that will be discussed inshallah soon. We'll try and wrap it up in the next few minutes. For males and females to cover the face for a couple of hours, like we said, less than 12 hours, that's what it means. Seven for a male to cover his head for a couple of hours, same. To perform tawaf al wada without wudu. So it will be done, but for doing the tawaf without wudu will be a dumb leaving any even one pebble from Rami. Now, this is the last 
last slide, I think. Um, when is less than sadaqah, 40, 50 pence equivalent? It's if a person kills a lice or kills a locust or to pluck one or two hair. Then it'll only be equivalent to that. If I can just take the questions. I obviously didn't come prepared. I think my battery is on one now. So I'll have to just... Bank. Okay, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Quick questions. There's only a few. Alhamdulillah, many have already been uh, answered. Number one, what if menstruation starts in the days of Hajj? So let's say you reach there on the fifth, on the fifth of Dhul Hijjah, and the woman is in her state of menstruation, sixth, seventh, eighth, they're going to Mina. Now, what does she do? She's not done her Umrah yet, because remember, it's haram for her to even enter the masjid. So this is exactly what happened to our mother Aisha radiallahu anha as well. She started to cry. Nabi Karim Sassam consoled her. Why are you crying for? This is something that Allah has destined on the daughters of Adam. Fine. Turn your intention now into Hajj and come with us. So you, now your intention is Hajj. Do all the rituals of Hajj as normal. Except for what you're not allowed to have, etc. But because you entered the niyat of Umrah, had you completed Umrah? No. The days of Hajj came. So you had to go for Hajj. For that, there are two things. Number one is, we will have to do Qadha. We will have to do the Qadha of the Umrah. Because we initiated the Umrah and we weren't able to fulfill it. And because we moved on to another Hajj, without even completing Hajj, uh, the Umrah, there will be a dumb, slaughtering the animal. So the question, why if menstruation starts in the days of Hajj, then continue and make the intention of Hajj. However, afterwards you will have to do the qadha of Umrah and you will have to slaughter an animal. This is what happened. After the days of Hajj were over, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sent our mother Aisha radiallahu with her brother Abdurrahman that go take her to Tan'im, put on the ihram specifically for Umrah and do your Umrah again. And since then, now that area Tan'im is known as Masjid Aisha Radilana. So that's the history behind it where Nabi Karim Sassam sent Hazrat Aisha and her brother go there because it's out of the boundary, put on the ihram and then re-enter. Another tip one of our uh, Ustads used to give is that when you enter into the state of ihram, you can enter into an unconditional generalized niyat. I'm entering into the state of ihram. So if a woman goes there right before she starts tawaf she has an option to select which type she's doing so if she happens to go there and alhamdulillah haid hasn't come mashallah i've reached here it's a faith i can do my umrah now make the intention of the umrah hajj tamattu etc however if she suffers from menstruation upon reaching there then she can make the intention of hajj ifrad hajj ifrad means she says i'm only gonna do hajj I'm not doing Umrah. That's valid as well. That you don't do Umrah. But that's a side note. Again, if there are particular questions as such, inshallah, our service will be available. Even other ulama. As for this group, for example, will only be for men. But obviously, women's, uh, their, their husbands and uh, their fathers or their brothers or so will be on the group. So they can ask those questions via them on the group. And if someone finds it slightly embarrassing for some reason, although it's anonymous, they can even private message, that's no problem. So inshallah, through the mahram. So in that way, we will put the, uh, send a question to their mahram and then they can pass on that information. So that's number one. Number two, someone has extreme eczema, keeping itching, uh, is there a penalty? Creams like E45. E45 is fine. Uh, it's fragrance free. Um, it's fine to apply it whilst in uh, ihram. Because again, it's not used as a fragrance. Uh, but it's because of some dry skin or skin problems, uh, etc. So that's totally fine whilst in the state of Ihram. Whilst doing our tawaf, why shouldn't we be looking at the Kaaba? Now, in a hadith, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that at tawaf, hawl al Kaaba, mithlu salah. That tawaf around the Kaaba is similar to salah. But then Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there's differences. Talking in namaz would break the namaz, but talking here, although dislike unnecessarily, it won't break it. So there are differences between tawaf and namaz, but they're very similar in a sense that just as salah requires dedication, focus, concentration, similarly, tawaf also seeks that dedication, that focus. We don't look here and there, 
But just as in namaz, our eyes are fixated at the place of sajda or so, in the same way, we're fixated in the direction we're moving in. Humble, looking down. And that's one of the wisdoms uh, behind it. Salah during Hajj, yeah, Qasar, or I think that's been discussed. I think all of them have been discussed. Eighth one, if you run out of pebbles in Mina, do you need to go back to Muzdalifa and collect more or just picking up new ones from Mina? You don't need to go to Muzdalifa. Yeah, the Kitab say it's makru to collect from there if it's the very pebbles which people have thrown them. Because now it's associated with the Jamarat, with the devil type. So ideally, we don't want to pick them up. But from Mina, anywhere, you can pick them up. That's why we said ideally pick up more so you have a stack of extra pebbles. If not, you can just find them from anywhere on the streets, on the roads. As we discussed, as long as it's not too big, as long as it's not dust particles, and it's a pebble, chickpea, we said, um, that's fine. Collect seven and that should be fine. It doesn't have to be from Muzdalifa. Is there anything else? Is there anything specific? Inshallah, I think we're going to conclude now just with a discussion on dua, dua making. But Alhamdulillah, we finished uh, our Umrah and Hajj until now. Uh, like we said, the group will take the contact details or so, whoever is interested. On there, we'll add the resources, including these as well. Uh, perhaps share the slides or uh, whatever. But are there any specific questions for now? Okay, if a person is doing Hajj on behalf of someone else, that is Hajj Badal, then we will do as normal Hajj Tamatto. So just as they would have gone from here and done the ritual, we will do the same. So we will do the same as if we're doing on behalf of someone that they were unable to do the Hajj, unfortunately. Okay, that's an important question. A lot of people ask, what if you're pelting the stone and you're in doubt, did it fall in or not? Trust me, you'll know. We must have seen the pictures that the area, remember, when we throw the stone, it's not necessary for it to, uh, for it to hit the wall. Rather, between the wall and some area that covers it, there's a space. So that's where, as long as it lands within the space, around the pillar and it's so big there'll be 100 percent certainty in whether it fell in or it didn't fall in but obviously if you're in doubt and you have extra you can always do one extra just to remove that doubt but otherwise it will be known whether it's fallen in or not and the other thing is yeah it's important also not to stand so far away I hit someone in the back or so. So slightly. And also another tip is, if everyone's moving in one direction and everyone wants to stand here, obviously it's going to create a crowd. So sometimes what's easier is just move to the back end. Here you'll see enough space and just do the seven and then move on. then that would be fine. Only if it's necessary. That would be fine. Then. It's only that if they are tired, can't be bothered or so, but here when genuinely they can't, then it's fine. Oh, that's fine as well. The question is that what if you're doing tawaf and you happen to face the Kaaba? when really you're walking in the direction of your tawaf route, then that's fine as well. That's fine. There's no penalty also. So you just continue. There's no penalty. This is just partly adab. Etiquette is that you don't face it, but there's no additional penalty for facing towards the Kaaba. And sometimes it may happen unnecessarily. Okay, the question is again a good question that tawaful wada is it better to delay it? Uh, then the answer is yes, 
but don't delay it so much so that then it becomes so difficult. Because obviously people will know that sometimes the coach will say it's going to arrive before it's time and then there's lots of packing to do and lots of running here and there and we may not have, have enough time. So yeah, leave enough time uh, yeah, yeah, to do it, but yeah, you want to delay it as much as possible and not to do it three, four, five days in advance, but do it at a time where we know we've got enough time. And where we can feel it, because many people, then they, they'll have to rush. You want to spend some quality time there and have enough time for other provisions as well afterwards. No, okay, good question. Tawafu al-Wada, is there a Sa'i? No, Sa'i is only if you're doing the Tawaf of Umrah and the Hajj one. Only Tawaf uh, ta of the Umrah or the Hajj. Uh, but in the Tawaf al-Wada, there's no Sa'i. There's only seven rounds of the Kaaba. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's Tawaf of Ziyarah on the 10th. On the 10th, the Tawaf of Hajj, we will go to Makkah and we will do the Tawaf of Ziyarah. Then we return to Mina for the 11th and the 12th or the 13th. But the Tawaf al Wada is basically the last ritual on the 12th and now you're in Makkah now. Now you don't come to Mina at all. Now you're in Makkah, you can stay in Makkah for five, six days, you can go to Medina, you can come back home. So now that's why you've taken your bags because you won't be returning now. So you now settle in your hotel. Well, it, it depends. Firstly, if, if, for example, the tour guide says, no, we will all be leaving from the camp at four o'clock. Uh, and you're traveling with the tour, with, with the group then you may do that. You may even only take yourself, not your belongings, do your Rami, come back, and then with the tour, you'll come with the coach back to Makkah. That's, this is the only option if you decide to walk it back or the general tour says, now we've got no coaches, we're just going to walk back. That's the option. And as for partly, you may have mentioned that, yeah, your own personal belongings. Some of those things may not be your personal belongings, like those gadlas and everything. You can't take them, I'm sorry, you can't put them in your suitcase and bring them back to England, although they may be as comfortable as anything. So certain things you'll have to leave behind, but yeah, your personal bag. So Tawafu Ziyara, the time begins from the 10th morning, 10th. So the majority of the people will be doing it on 10th. Come on, that's our nature, isn't it? Quickly, let's go and do it. Yeah. So many of the people will want to do it on the 10th. In the morning, afternoon, evening, at night. Some people will be going at 11th morning because assuming after the 10th, the crowd will be less. So you can do all day throughout the 11th whenever. If not, you can do all the way 12, right until the Maghrib of the 12th. So you can do it anytime on the 10th, not before it, anytime on the 10th, anytime on the 11th, anytime on the 12th, as long as before Maghrib. Now, if you've not done it, you will still do it afterwards, but you'll have to slaughter sheep or goat. No, that can be done anytime after Tawafu Ziyarah. So, for example, on the 12th, you came back uh, to Makkah and your flight is on the 13th next day and you want to do it on the 12th, that's fine. As long as it's after Tawafu Ziyarah, the Tawaf of Hajj. That you can as well, but ideally you want to do tawaf and then sa'i, but if you were to do it, it would be valid. Are there any questions? Sorry. Okay, that's a good question. It's only that I was going to discuss it and I thought it might get confusing for some people. Okay, now the flexibility is in this sa'i. You might be thinking to yourselves, 
You know what? Tawafu ziyara. Can you imagine a million people or so all going from Mina and going to Makkah and trying to do tawaf at similar timings? It's chaotic. In a nice way, you got to breathe the air, enjoy the experience, get pushed. Don't push anyone. But that's part of the experience. Now you might think to yourself, there's a lot to do on the 10th. Rami, Daba, Halak Qasar, go all the way back to Makkah, hotel, hotel to Masjid Haram, Tawafu Ziyara. I don't know if I'll be able to do the Sa'i. How long would that take? One and a half hours during Hajj? Around that time. So shall I just save some time? Then it's possible, this is the only flexibility, to bring Sa'i before it's time. You can't bring the Tawafu Ziyara, but the Sa'i you can do it in advance. When? When we were discussing on the 7th or 8th, when you put on your ihram for Hajj, then you are allowed to do Sa'i, but Sa'i can only be done with two conditions. First condition is that it must be done with the ihram on, and the other is must be after a valid tawaf. So if you want to do Sa'i on the 7th or 8th, then first you'll have to put your ihram on for Hajj. Then you go to Masjid Haram, you do a nafal tawaf, seven rounds, and then you follow the same rules. Remember we said ittiba, exposing the right, doing ramal in the three rounds. After you've done the seven rounds of tawaf, then you can do the sa'i. And once you've done that, now you can go mina. And then when it comes on the 10th, you don't need to do that sa'i anymore because you did it before it's time. So there is that scope. It is allowed to do that. So let me give you a brief quick example. The tour guide says we're leaving at five o'clock. Five o'clock, Asr time, after Asr, we're going to go. Let's say on the seventh, let's say at night. So you think I've still got six, seven hours before we're going, to, before we're leaving. So I'm going to put my ihram for going to Mina in the five hours anyway. Why don't I just put it slightly before? Just do a tawaf and do sa'i and I'll be back within two, three hours. That's fine. So it is allowed to do sa'i. The one sa'i that you're meant to do after tawafu ziyara, before it's time, even on the 7th and 8th, as long as you put the ihram on by then and you do a tawaf after which you do the sa'i. Another thing as well is some people, for first timers, have this question. They say that, oh, do we have to do sa'i every time we do tawaf? No. Because once you're not in the state of ihram and once you're doing your voluntary nafal tawafs, you can do as many as you can and it's greatly rewarding, but you don't need to do sa'i. Sa'i is only when you do tawaf and sa'i for umrah or hajj. Yeah, no. yeah the, the one that I'm meant to do afterwards. So you can do it without any dislike before it's done. Yeah, jazakum Allah khaira. For that, if there's any other questions or so. Yeah, no. I think Rami, some scholars say after Asr. They say, for example, Rami, on some of the days, people will try to rush as soon as after Zawal. On the 11th and 12th, we said it begins after Zohar time. So now, because it begins after Zohar time, everyone will march towards trying to do the Rami then. So to wait for a few hours until Asr time, once Asr time sets in, you just pray Asr and you go then do it. That might be less crowd. But... In general, I think Mana Muhammad Sahib will be able to help in this as well. But in general, that's what we said that if you go stay with the coach, stay with the crowd, unless um, you know your way. Because we, we have had experiences, which I'm not going to share all of them because of time. But there have been, for example, once when we were walking, we walked it from Mina to Arafat. But literally, we had to fight for our lives then. Uh, and we didn't expect, we were, some, we were young. Not that I'm old now, but we were still young. And we were walking some friends and we thought, you know what, we'll walk here, we've got enough time. It so happened we took the wrong turn not knowing and we're in the middle of this crowd and literally we saw, peop we saw people with their ihrams fallen off, uh, tramped over, ripped apart. They've lost their ihrams. Another benefit of keeping a spare ihram. Another guy, I think we were carrying one bag or something, the, the handle of it broke and, and one guy was on the phone. He needed an emergency ambulance coming in to assist him, to help him because he was wounded. So if you happen to take the wrong turn or so, that could be problematic. Then we realized because that was the way towards the masjid. 
So there was a heavy crowd there. So it would have been better for us to take another route had we known. So that's why we say it's the timings, the place. When we're unaware, the safest route is Sawadul Adam. That means the majority of the people stay with the tour guide and wherever they happen to be. Is there anything additional? Yeah, no problem. Okay, the, there are two opinions in regarding to that. However, Mufti Daki Sahib writes in his kitab that if you were sitting, but you're not resting against something, but you're just simply sitting like many people do in Tashahud or how we normally sit, uh, as many of the people are sitting, as long as the uh, backside is fixed on the ground, then, th and as long as you're not leaning against something, the wudu will not break. So even if you were to have a small you know, nap there. However, if you're lying down and the back is slightly above the ground or you're leaning against something, if it were to be removed, you would fall, then you would have to do. And although we're, we're trying to talk positive here, but like Mana Muhammad explained many a times, you'll see many all sorts of things, but don't fall into that. And literally, you see some people, they lie down, they go sleep. You can actually hear them. You can hear them snoring. Namastan. And you're like, brother, you've not done wudu. Man. You just got to ignore people. Then you help him if he didn't know. But otherwise, so you will see different people from different backgrounds. But yeah, for us, do wudu. Uh, if you're leaning, resting, lying down, etc. Unless you're sitting in a normal position and you happen to just nap for a little while, then it wouldn't break the wudu. Azizia, I think that was discussed that previously, what would happen, majority of the tours going from here to Haram, the hotel prices near the Hajj days go skyrocketing. It's really exorbitant, it's expensive. So what they would do is, few days before Hajj, they move you away from the hotels around Makkah and take you slightly closer to Mina. That's, Azizia is an area. So there the prices are cheap as well. So, and it's closer to Mina, so sometimes it's more convenient. So that was, the area's name was Azizia. So they'd be calling a shifting package. you normally there near Haram. Last few days, just before your Hajj, you go there. And then you, Mina is close by. So it's cheap. It's more accessible to Mina. And after you return from Mina, mostly you stay for two, three days. So they don't bring you back to the hotels near Makkah. They keep you there in Azizia area. That was the case before when our tour guides would take us. Now is the shifting package or there's uncertainty or we're not sure? Sorry? Oh, so they've not specified. So we don't know. It's possible they could take you to Azizia or Oh depends on the package. So if you want to give lots of money, most probably you won't be shifted. Oh, there's no shifting. So, oh, there, if they're slightly away, then they are slightly away. So, they won't be that shifting to Azizia. Then, if you're there, that you're there all the time. Another thing is, yes, try your utmost best to pray all your namaz, as explained even yesterday, in Haram, in Masjid Haram, in Masjid Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, if you were shifted to Azizia, or if your hotel happens to be really far, now near the days, or slightly before the days of Hajj or so, the roads are closed, it can become inconvenient. So what we will say is you've got family members, you've got children, you've got elderly, it may not be possible to go in and out every namaz. So there's local masjids there, so many are people, for all these years, they'll just pray locally when possible. They'll go there perhaps Asr time, they'll go Haram, pray Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and slightly afterwards come back, and they might pray Fajr and Ish, uh, Zohar at the local masjid. So again, as we said, you want to be prepared for Hajj, don't overdo yourself, and see what's more convenient for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is that, yeah, sometimes it's not possible. If you can move, then move to where you can't see and you're slightly away. 
But many a times, especially now, you're restricted in areas, so you wouldn't be able to move. So what I would say is, as long as you know the area is different, because they've got boards over here where there's men, they've got some women who are there, but they've got their separate boards, and it's restricted. So this is where, because you can't even get into the masjid, so you're on the courtyard outside. So, so that's fine even if there's some women inside the masjid. So that would be fine. As long as in your direct self and rose, there's no immediate women there. What they would generally say, what we definitely say is avoid tooth, uh, toothpaste in the state of ihram. You want to avoid toothpaste, similarly you want to avoid flavoured uh, miswak. So definitely avoid it. Then if someone were to say, what if someone was to apply? Now if it has a very strong scent, mint scent, very strong, uh, then we would say that if a person did so, it could be a penalty. But if it doesn't have a such a strong scent, and if a person were to do it once, then we would say sadaqa. If the intention isn't fragrance, if the intention is cleansing the mouth, that is also. But you want to avoid anything with a strong scent. Anything with a strong scent must be avoided. Yes, unless it's food, which is cooked. If it's cooked, then even with the scent, it's okay. But if the intention isn't fragrance, and the fragrance doesn't have an overwhelming smell, then it won't be a dumb. Yeah, no problem. Is that okay? You can, we'll be around here anyway. You can ask. Um, I've got a message that for the past half an hour, the sisters are waiting because clearly they can't ask the questions and they're just uh, listening in. So if there are any questions that they are in this majlis, me and Mufti Hanif will both be here. You can ask, inshallah. Um, and obviously, you can ask on the group later on as well. So we'll, we'll stop it there. We did say quote past four on both days. We've kind of gone over. Uh, so before I hand over to Imam Sab, um, I'd just like to say Jazakallah khairan to all of you uh, for your phenomenal attendance over the past uh, two days. Some of you have come from out of town. Uh, some of you obviously are local. You've spent your uh, busy Saturdays and Sundays and come here. You know, it's no mean feat. Uh, people are busy left, right, center. You've got so much things to do. You've got so much probably packing to do, uh, last minute shopping and whatever else. Uh, but you've taken out the time uh, to, to attend. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. May He fill your lives with as much khair and barakah as possible. And I hope, inshallah, and pray that the outcome on Wednesday is favorable. It will be. Whether you've been selected for the ballot, alhamdulillah, if you've not been selected, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Hakim, all wise. He has better plans for you. Uh, so Jazakallah khair to all of you uh, for attending today, for all the sisters that have attended today. Jazakallah to our uh, Imam Sab um, and to Mufti Khalid Sab and to mashallah all the technical support that we've had. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you all, all khair, uh, khair and barakah. Jazakallah to this masjid who hosted us and facilitated for this program. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي ونسلم على رسوله الكريم أما بعد إن شاء الله we'll try to keep it as brief as I can so we can get the questions and answers out of the way but I think it is very very important that we understand that making dua when we go to Mecca when we go to Medina when we are in the plains of Arafah it is very very vital it is very very important I would just like to mention one verse of the Quran and explain how important dua is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions with regards to Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. So hajj is connected with who? Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam. Allah ta'ala, he mentions, وَإِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ رَبِّ جَعَلْ هَذَا بَلَدًا آمِنَا وَارْزُقْ أَهْلَهُ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ مَنْ آمَنَ مِنْهُمْ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions that remember that time when Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, Rabbi Ja'al. Now, from the very first word, we get a very important lesson. We understand and implement a very important lesson. Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, he mentions, Rabbi Ja'al. He says, Oh my Allah, oh my Rabb. What do we learn? 
that Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam when asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is asking with utter humbleness and with utter humility and this is exactly what we need to instill within our duas that when we lift our hands up before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we have complete humbleness we have complete humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why because we are the ones who are asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are in need of of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah ta'ala he does not need us we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if Allah ta'ala grants it to us then each and everything will be for us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he does not need us in any sort of way so when asking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lower your heads raise your hands and weep and beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he mentions Rabbi ja'al hadha baladan amina he mentions with regards to Makkatul Mukarrama at the time of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam Makkatul Mukarrama was complete barren there was nothing imagine how accepted the dua of Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was was that till this date after that dua till this date millions and millions of people flocked towards Makkah and Medina for the Hajj and for the Umrah imagine how much it was accepted in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Rabbi ja'al hadhan balad, hadha baladan amina warzuq ahla he mentions with regards to uh, aman security with regards to having peace and security imagine there are so many people so we learn that one thing that we need to ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam did is that we need to ask for security we need to ask for peace we need to ask for tranquility so many people they live lavish lives they live in within mansions they have great houses so much so much they are so rich but one thing that we don't have so many people complain with regards to is that they do not have the peace of mind and the contentment of the heart you're going to Makkah to Mukarrama you go to Medina to Munawwara you're on the plains of Arafah ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for peace for tranquility this is one thing that we learn from the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam that ask for peace he mentions warzuq ahla ask for sustenance ask for your risk from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you want sustenance if you are finding it hard then ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he mentions a great important lesson here is that Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam when he is asking for rizq for the ahl Makkah he does not ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that make the lands of Makkah fertile rather the neighboring cities like Taif and other cities that is where the vegetation that is where the fruit used to come from why because Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam he knew that people will come to Makkah to Mukarrama and he wanted that no Everybody makes themselves busy in agriculture, in business. Rather, when they come to Makkah to Mukarrama, they come for the sole purpose of acquiring the close proximity of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, becoming close to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, understanding who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is, understanding the ma'rifat of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. One thing that we make a mistake is that so many hujjaj they will go for hajj and we will send large shopping lists with them now these shopping lists that we send with them it is not needed my dear respect to brothers in islam so many of them they will go for hajj they don't even have time to do their own shopping now we are sending our shopping list with them now they are so they are so tense they are so stressful that if i don't get this shopping for this person that person then he will become naras he will become unhappy if i don't get do shopping for this person my mama my mommy my masa my masi my nana my nani they are each and their neighbors each and every person is sending their shopping list there's already tension there is already stress and upon that stress and tension we are giving them additional stress and tension so avoid sending your shopping lists. Look, most of the things we get in and around Preston, we get it in and around England. We have most of the stuff that we sell here, they sell in Makkah al Mukarramah, in Medina al Munawwara. Look, keep your shopping list brief. Make sure, make sure most of your time is spent in Makkah, to, meaning spent in Masjid al Haram rather than the clock towers, rather than Zamzam towers and all these other shopping places. So that's one thing. Also, so many people, it's according to your financial abilities. Look, you are spending so many thousands of pounds going to Makkah al Mukarramah, going for Hajj. Now, on top of this, people are sending lists worth shopping lists worth about 100 pounds, 200 pounds, 300 pounds. Now, where do these Hujjaj get the money from? This is another tension. 
another stress. So try not to put this additional stress upon the hujjaj. So also with regards to making dua, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions that the pilgrims who make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are delegation. When they lift their hands and they make dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will most definitely answer their dua. When they make dua of a maghfirat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will most definitely forgive these hujjaj. So make, make sure that whenever you find any sort of free time, make sure you take out time and you ask and beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way of ma making dua is that you first you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imagine going and asking someone that i want this i want this i want this no this is rude you are asking from the almighty allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so first praise allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thereafter praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send durood upon rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after sending durood upon rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then ask for your needs ask for your needs in this world and also do not forget the akhirah that is your eternal abode that is your everlasting life don't just ask for your needs that i need this in this world and this in this world no Ask for the needs of the akhirah. Remember how you will be put, the, how the coffin will be put onto you, how you will be lowered into the grave. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, make me die with the kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. When I am lowered into my grave, help me with the questioning. Expand my, expand, expand my cover. Make my cover filled with light, with nur, with the fragrance of Jannah. When I am resurrected on the day of Qiyamah, help me on the day of Qiyamah. Save me from the dhulmat, save me from the darkness of the day of Qiyamah. Help me under your, give me shade under your throne on the day of Qiyamah. Ask for all these things from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Allah ta'ala that he grants us entry into Jannatul Firdaus without any sort of questioning. So one thing, so what I want you to take is that whatever time you find in Makkah al Mukarrama, in Madinah al Munawwara, when you are on the plains of Arafah, whilst you are doing your Hajj, whatever time you find, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make the most of it. Make make the most of it. You have been accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look, if you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this will not decrease any of the wealth and the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has infinite. He has more than what we can ever comprehend. Ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be hopeful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will most definitely accept our du'as. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the tawfiq and the ability to practice upon whatever has been said. Before I finish, I would like to express my gratitude towards Mufti Hani Sab and Malana Muhammad Sab. They have taken out their time and they have actually explained the practical way of doing Hajj and Umrah in a very effective, very easy and a very useful way and a very applicable way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them barakah in their ilm in the amal and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our hajj may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us to hajj and umrah time and time again if you want to ask